radio side off and running. That always helps. And then die cast it. Nice to have you back. The gorgeous Teresa. The lovely and talented Kara McIver from Saskatchewan. Wave Kara so we could all see you and wave back. Thank you for joining us. John Brown, welcome to SOR Chat. The gorgeous Pat, Pam McSee, National Memorial, good to have you here. Grandmaster, what's up? Kathari, welcome back two nights in a row. And uh, BBD Warrior, good to see you. And the lovely Dutch princess, Sally Vandevoord, has returned. There she is, GF, 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 G, how are you? Good to have you here. And uh, I think we all, we're caught up. Holy cow, we're caught up. We made it. Remember, a great way to support this show is the Super Chat is open. So thank you so much for joining us. High 509er. If you're brand new here, do not forget to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell because we are here seven days a week for your listening entertainment. Hi, Phil Minervito. The Preston Beckett, how are you? The Gorgeous Dirt Road, nice to have you here. And did I miss anybody? Solar Warden, Logan L., good to have you here. Dirty Filth, good to see you, buddy. Jose, what's happening? And uh, guess what? We're talking time tonight. Lisa Broderick is going to tell us her story in like five seconds. So do me a favor, get your horns up. It's time to rock to Bumblefoot. Let's do it. mountains of central british columbia to you listening around the world this my friends is spaced out radio i am your host dave scott sitting in the captain's chair of sor headquarters we welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around north america digitally on talk stream live revolution radio and kpnl all of our archives are free go to youtube.com forward slash space down radio do old davy the favor hit that subscribe button you can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag and so much more. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Oh, do we have a good one for you tonight? Yes, we do. Author Lisa Broderick is here. She's going to explain everything about time. And I'm going to be honest with you. Time is one of those things that scares me. You know why? It runs out. But Lisa's going to debate me on that because she's probably going to slap me around and tell me point blank that I am dead wrong on this subject. So let's learn about our favorite author here on time. Lisa is an accomplished senior executive whose career has been defined by understanding how technology impacts society and changes behavior. She is also someone who experiences and studies the world in terms of data, best practices, and quantum science. Lisa teaches that life is about constant change, in which energy and matter are the basis of transformation. Now, she's got a groundbreaking book out called All the Time in the World. It reveals how new scientific literature is ref- revolutionizing our understanding of what time is, and more importantly, how we can affect it. Allthetimebook.com is the website. Lisa, welcome to Spaced Out Radio for the first time. How are you? Thanks so much for having me. This is great. It is great. And unfortunately, we don't have you on camera tonight. You're in a hotel room somewhere in Seattle, or you're at your house somewhere, but you're doing a tour in Seattle virtually. I I don't really understand because, you know, I'm Canadian. We don't have that much technology up here just yet. You know, maybe maybe in 50 years or something like that. But it is so good to have you here. And, you know, it's not uh, very often we have some executives who come on this show talking about, you know, things that would interest our audience. Have you always been a little bit of a, and I mean this politely, a different thinker, a a world thinker, a universal type thinker? Always. That's a big term, but I will say I did have a death experience at a very young age. And from what I can remember, although memories grow and change, I was different afterwards. That's when I was about four years old. And I fell through a plate glass window in a remote part of Arizona and bled out pretty much at the scene. 
Uh, but I remember the whole thing. I remember being on the plate glass window, half in, half out. I remember riding to this hospital or the country facility in the back of the station wagon. And most uh, vividly, I remember looking down from above at where I was when I was being tended to. But then I was back in my body and a little girl full of life. But I was different, Dave. The world was different. It was alive. And I discovered I had a superpower. And the superpower was I understood and felt like I could control time. No way. Oh, my. Yes let's, way. Let's go back to what happened. How did you fall through that table? Oh, I fell through the window. And so we were, my parents were New Yorkers who had moved to Arizona. Arizona uh, at the time in the 60s was a seat of a new industry called the computer industry. Imagine. And um, we were in a cabin in the mountains, in the White Mountains in Arizona. And my sister and I, she was a year younger. We were jumping on the bed as little girls would do. And my mother was sitting there. My father was playing pool a couple of a couple of uh, cabins down and the bed was on coasters and it rolled away and as it rolled away i felt uh, myself flying through the air my mother remembers seeing me fly through the air in slow motion and i went through the plate glass window head first and stayed there half in half out holy cow and when you went through this experience do you remember falling i remember falling in, in a spiritual psychic sense or falling into the window Falling into the window and then falling and hitting the ground. I never hit the ground. I was impaled on the window. Oh. Yeah, ouch. Oh. It is something my family did not talk about for a very long time. Oh, my goodness. And so finally we did start to talk about it, and I started to ask about it and remember. But since that time, I had an unusual experience with time, and that is I would often be able to slow down the field Imagine a little person, you know, in first and second and third grade doing soccer and track and having these experiences of slowed down time, which I did. There's a story in the book when I was eight years old and I bowled a nearly perfect game in bowling because I was so in the zone that if I bowled in a different direction, I still got a strike. It was a heck of a childhood. And I didn't really tell anybody for fear that I would be seen as crazy or weird. But I knew that this was a growing ability of mine. And later in my 20s, I learned to meditate, and then I really started to open up. I realized that time and reality and so many things we think about are not what we think. There's something else going on there. I am a big sports fan, and I used to cover the NHL back in my radio days because I had a face for radio back then, still do. And I will say this, in all the interviews I ever heard of Wayne Gretzky, the one thing that he always said and people always commentated on was that he it was like he was able to slow down time and mm -hmm. slow the game and everything down to his pace to control everything that was happening on the ice. And that's why he became the greatest player ever in, in modern history of hockey, you know, and, and when I hear you talking about that, I quickly got a flash to that because I mean, Gretzky is my idol and you know, he's one of those people who often talked about seeing things happen before they happened and, and reading everything and slowing down the pace. And, and is that kind of what happens to you after this incident as a child? It is. And actually, that that experience in sports is quite common. Bill Russell famously talked about it going back to the 70s. And he didn't want to talk about it because he thought he would be seen as crazy or weird. But there were times on the field he could slow down the court, pick every shot, do what he needed to do. Now it's taught in athletics, as you know. It's taught for people to use imagery and this this growing ability that we may have as human beings to slow down the field and slow down time. It can be very useful in athletes. To an eight-year-old girl, it was a little weird. Uh, okay, so going back to eight years old, before we get more into time, I want to learn more about your near-death experience. When did you pop out of your body? Almost immediately. So at, in, on, at the scene, again, this is a very remote part of Arizona, which was very remote at the time. In the 60s, way, northern Arizona near the Grand Canyon was not very populated, and it's still not. So I was there. We, were in the, we had cabins in a place called the White Mountains, and I was half in, half out. I remember vaguely things like that, but I can tell the orientation of my body. I can remember that to this day. A doctor was on the scene and told my mother that I wasn't going to make it. And so you can imagine that everything else ensued from that. And I, uh, because I was probably unconscious, and I say probably 
Absolutely, I was unconscious. When you think about the medical aspect of this, unconscious, I remember everything. I remember the station wagon and the siding on it and where I was and which door I was put into and the orientation in the station wagon and then getting to the medical facility, which was not a hospital. It was a country facility. And then seeing from above, I did not see my body, but I could see and I can still draw if I if I needed to the facility from above. There was a window on the right. There was a metal uh, medicine cabinet on my right. The table was below me. There were people below me doing things. There was a light. I remember all of that. And then suddenly I was back. Suddenly I was not not above anymore. And when I woke up conscious later on, of course, I was in a body cast from my armpits to my waist in Phoenix in the summer. So you can imagine that. Uh, but I, I remembered much of the experience, even though my family never talked about it. They were quite uh, traumatized by what had happened. Well, they were probably just happy to have their little girl back, and that was miracle in itself. Oh, yeah, I would think so. You know, for you, though, when did you start noticing your change in everything, in the way you looked at life? Was it when you became conscious of it? Was it a few months later? So you think back as, as memories, and I've studied memories and the brain and brain waves, and, you know, memories grow and change, and they're informed by the present, right? So we may have a memory of something, and we see something in our present life 30, 40, 50 years later, and it accrues to the memory we think we had 60 years ago. With that said, at the time, everything was alive, Dave. Everything was but I, I was a little girl, and so I would see animals as alive. But to this day, I thank the garbage. The garbage is alive. So here's a thought about consciousness. If, if everything is consciousness, then you have minerals. And so what can minerals do? Min minerals can grow, they can accrete, and they can decay, right? They grow mountains and they get flatter. And so then you have plants, and plants can accrete and decay, and they can also seek and ingest food. A different level of consciousness, all conscious. Then you have animals. Animals can accrete and decay. They can ingest and seek food. And they can do other behaviors. They have emotions. Animals are with tremendous emotion. So another level of consciousness. And then you have humans. We think we're the top of the food chain. I'm not so sure about that. So we can do everything that all the other types of consciousness can do. But the one thing that we may be able to do that others cannot do is that we can seek to become. So my cat, Al, cannot seek to become the best cat ever. But I could seek to become. I could seek to become an author or a pilot or an astronaut or write a book on time. So I think of everything as alive anyway. But I was aware of this at a very young age. For you growing up with this special power or ability, whatever you want to call it, how did it define how you grew up as a young girl going into teenagehood and then into college and then into adulthood? Well, as a young girl, I was an, an, an animal lover because I'd, I had known that everything was alive. So I was a bit of a Dr. Doolittle. I had animals of all kinds. I had a tortoise that we would ride. I had a six-foot green iguana in Phoenix, which I would walk on a leash, which I gave to the Phoenix Zoo when we moved away back to Silicon Valley. I had saved pigeons and chickens, and I had a crayfish named George. So everything was alive because they were all personal to me, personalities. That's what I remember most. But also... When I would run, Dave, the field slowed down, just like Wayne Gretzky. I could run in slow motion. And in fact, I would sometimes have nightmares in slow motion because I was so rattled by this experience of time that I had. Only later on, after the bowling incident, and then there's a story in the book about my driving to take the SAT, and I, arrived, I left way too late to arrive on time, but I had to get in to college, and I had to take the SAT, so I did arrive on time. After that, I started to appreciate that this might be something I could develop. And then I learned to meditate in my 20s and everything changed. You are a professional woman. You are someone who has been highly successful in, uh, in a professional corporate matter. How did that forge your career, those experiences? Oh, there are some funny stories in the book. And so they, I call them business miracles, you know, the thing that happens and everybody looks around the table and thinks to themselves, how did this happen? And I just shrug my shoulders and say, I don't know. So um, the ability to time and matter are inextricably linked. We know that. In fact, my theory of time, one of the theories of time that's out there is that time only exists because matter moves. No movement, no matter, no time. That's interesting. 
Some people think that time is something that is a property of the universe. I'm not sure I agree with that. In any event, so if time and matter and energy are all inextricably linked, then we could use them to create things we want, experiences we want, which I do to this day. In fact, being on the show and writing the book and the other things that have happened in my life, I've sort of created with this ability to change and manipulate time. Time is so scary for a lot of people myself included. I don't think of myself as a 48 year old man, you know, deep down, if I were to look inside myself, I, I feel about 30, you know, maybe a little bit more handsome at this age, but, but about 30, you know, I, I love the way I think. I love the way I can, can, uh, take a message and break it down better than when I was younger. But you know what? Life is short and everything that we do is time related. And I want to get a lot more into that when we get back from the break at the bottom of the hour. We still got about eight minutes left. But for you, figuring out time that you had the ability to manipulate it, how has this affected your daily life? Well, it's a daily life. One thing about this show, and that is I don't sleep in a normal fashion. I only sleep from 11 to 3 a.m. And then I do things, which I'll share with you later on, between 3 and 6 a.m., which are all about changing time and creating things in my life. So then I sleep a little bit more between 6 and 8 if I have to get up. And so my daily life consists of creating things that I want, thinking about things I want, manipulating time at this wonderful, mystical time at night between 3 a.m. local time, and then getting up the next day and living it. It's like living the movie you want to create every single day of your life, and you've created it in advance. You're the writer, the director, the actor, the script, the everything. How come when we were kids, time moved so slowly? And then, like, I noticed it when I became a parent at 25 years old and my daughter was born. That's when I noticed how all of a sudden time is just started speeding up and everything happening so fast. What is that shift? Well, I think that shift is more biological. And of course, we're biological entities. Our brains are fabulous computers, but it's neurochemical processes, right? So a theory about that, which is time passing slowly when you're a child and more rapidly when you grow older, is the feebleness of the brain. I'm sorry, Dave. Apparently, the the theory is, not my theory, another's theory, and that is when you're young, your brain is agile and wonderful and growing and doing all kinds of things, and it takes lots of pictures. It has lots of memories. So imagine a deck of cards, and there's a lot of cards. It's very thick. If you were to flip the deck of cards, flip through them, you'd see a lot of cards, a lot of memories, and it would go slowly. Later on, as your brain becomes a little feeble, like for those of us who've been around for a while, it may take fewer pictures. It may have fewer memories. Your deck of cards is thinner. And with a thinner deck of cards, you can flip through them more quickly. Time seems to pass more quickly as we age. That's one theory. Yeah, because, you know, I remember when, you know, as a kid, my parents would give, you know, yell out the front door, give you the 10 minute warning if you were playing with your buddies, you know, and it's getting late. And, you know, you got the street lights about to come on and you're playing football or or baseball or hide and go seek or something along those lines. Ten minutes seemed to take forever. It did. Your brain was taking a lot of lots of pictures, your young, agile brain. Think of the deck of cards. It's very thick with memories. Later on, you got a little you got a skinny deck. You can flip through it more quickly. Time passes more quickly. That's a biological explanation. But that doesn't mean that's what time is. Hmm. Okay, so define time then. Well, in one sense, time is our experience of moving around. No movement, no change, no time. Think about it. If you were in a world that had no change, would there be time? We chronicle time by the movement of the earth relative to the sun, where there's day and night. Movement. The earth is moving around the sun, right? More movement. And then the galaxy, solar system. All of this is movement. No movement, no time. So here's a, here's a thought. Time is a linear construct created for this plane of existence. Now that's a mind bender. It's linear. We've constructed it. It's based on motion. Is it really? There's a plane of existence and dimensions. Maybe it only exists for us like now, like it does now because of the dimensions we're in. A lot of people believe time was shifted in 2012 and something happened with the Mayan calendar to speed things up. 
Do you buy that? Well, a more I, I tend to stick to scientific explanations, although I'm a very spiritual person, you know, deep di- deep down my own beliefs. You know, a lot can be explained when you talk about multiverses, and that is a valid scientific explanation for time. And that is birthed in every moment is an is a timeline which is coming out of this moment now, which is going in parallel again uh, uh, alongside the moment that was just that just happened while it continues in its way so that an infinite number of universes are all going parallel at the same time. So if there was a shift in the mind ca- uh, calendar, maybe we all just shifted to a new timeline in the multiverse. Oh, that answers uh, would answer so many questions. And that would completely, not to sound too much woo for you, but that would completely answer the entire idea of something as weird as the Mandela effect. It would answer something as the Mandela effect, right? And basically, the Mandela effect is where you are experiencing something that hasn't happened yet. It's like the uh, the converse of deja vu, <laughs> right? And so you're experiencing this thing, and it would be a group experience. A lot has been done in group consciousness, the Global Consciousness Project with Dean Radin, right? And so there are many thoughts about how we can experience things as a group, experience things that haven't happened yet, experience things that have happened but didn't happen that way. And a multiverse is a valid explanation. Also, people lose time in terrible accidents. The next segment, I'll tell you stories about people who've simply lost time. They may have ended up in a different universe. Well, and that's my thought. And now now you got my head spinning here because now we're getting into a lot of the topics that I enjoy. And I t- tend to believe a lot of these, you know, missing 411 type people are actually alive, but somehow went into a different dimension or a portal or something that took them to a different timeline. It absolutely may have. And again, the stories of lost time where people should have died. I know people personally who've had these experiences. I had one. I I had an experience, and many of them are while driving, by the way. So watch out when you're driving. Be careful. No texting. So experiences happen while driving, probably because danger is very possible while driving. I mean, it's a giant vehicle. It's a weapon in a sense. You could harm yourself or others. People are driving very fast. Accidents happen. And somehow people survive, but they've lost time. Maybe it's because they didn't survive in the other multiverse, and they survived in this one. And we're all going forward with them. Wow. This is going to be a lot more heavy than what I thought. (laughs) <laughs> and what I, and then what I, I love you already. I do. I I am a fan already. And, and you know. Wait till we talk about ETs. I have some theories there. Mm, well, we can get into that because I'm an experiencer. Oh. Yes. And I've been face to face with a couple of extraterrestrials. And none of this nighttime sleeping crap either. I'm right. Too, you know, so. I'm game to go with ETs later on. Definitely. That, that, <laughs> Wonderful. That's my game. That's my game right there. We got about 90 seconds before we have to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Author Lisa Broderick is our guest tonight. She has a brand new book out called All the Time in the World. It can be found at any major bookstore. I'm, I'm definitely adding this one to my library. But Lisa, as we move on, you know, and people fit everything into time, you know, are, are we really enclosing ourselves into our own environment and shutting down our own lives because we worry too much about time? Yes, I would think so. I would say so. And that is if time is a linear construct, the verb construct, right? We've constructed it. Break out of that. Here's an idea. Pull yourself out of time. In the rest of the show, we'll talk about pulling yourself right out of time, stepping out of time. Here's how you do it. And there's one thing that I care about, and that it's people living a life of of fulfillment and promise and meaning that's possible but not if you're a slave to time Mm. yes i would consider myself a slave to time totally a slave to time (laughs) well by the end of this show we'll have you freed oh please please do because i work 16 hours a day and i and i sleep very little like you my mind is always going and uh meditation i try i I try and meditate every day every Mm -hmm. day in the shower so I don't know if it's working or not, but, you know, we'll find out. Lisa, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. We have Lisa Broderick on tonight. Her website, allthetimebook.com, a brand new book called All the Time in the World. You can get it at any major bookstore. This is one you want. This is what you're looking for. Slow down time. 
Life's too short. Let's make it happen. See what we got when we come back on Spaced Out Radio right after this. Stay tuned. I'm not going to lie. I'm caught off guard here in a good way. I rarely am caught off guard. This will be fun. Oh, you just. It's already fun. You're talking my language, lady, and I'm liking <laughs> it. Wait till we talk sine waves and phase, Dave. We're really going to get into it. Oh, you're going to break me tonight. You are going to break me. I love oh, it. It'll be fun. I love it. I am just so enthralled by this. Because honestly, and I'll get into this next half hour. I try not to give up too much during the break. But um, time scares, like I said to you, time scares me. It really does. I never thought I would see myself two years away from 50. Or not even. Holy cow. Like, that's like a, a number. Year and we're going to, we're going to, we'll, we'll dive into that if you want to get a little, little, not, not personal in a way that's too oh, revealing. I, I, but we oh, I don't, have some fun. I don't mind getting personal. Okay. I, I'm an open book to my audience. Here's the thing, Dave. When you've had a death experience, you, you know that no one and nothing ever dies. In fact, I'll tell the story of my mother's death where she came back. And people were in the room and my brother was in the room, not in her corporeal body, but in a way that she was manipulating electricity to let us know she was there. She didn't go anywhere. She had an out-of-body experience. She was out of phase, Dave. I think it's a measurement issue having to do with phase, literally. That might be the entire answer to the paranormal. I th- I, I believe it is. Phase, right? Two si- Think of two sine. We can go into the two sine waves, one slightly behind. You wouldn't see it. They get into resonance. Then you do see it. I have, a, I have an analogy. I use the two, uh, two flutes, which I think people really can wrap their heads around what phase is and how, can, how it could be out of phase so that you could, wouldn't see an alien or you'd see them briefly and then they'd be gone or the paranormal. All of the paranormal is explained this way. That's fun. All right. I'm believing you. <laughs> I am totally, totally believing you. Well, it's a lot of fun to think about. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to Thomas Fessler and Simon for kicking off the Super Chats tonight and Dirt Road as well. Thank you so much for your support here on the Mighty SOR. I really do appreciate it. The Super Chat is a great way to support what we do on a nightly basis. So thank you so much. And uh, Thomas, by the way, great show tonight and last night as well. Uh, I love it that you helped set me up, dude. Uh, you, you do a great job. Great, great job. R&R, thank you for that Super Chat as well. Really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, it's good. It's good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to tackle one of my fears tonight. Time. Yeah, Lisa Broderick is here. Uh, Lisa, we have about uh, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Scaring the crap out of me already. (laughs) Reverend Keith here? I didn't even see Reverend Keith. Where's Reverend Keith? I don't even see him yet. Love me some Reverend Keith. Well, if you're here, I don't see you in the chat room. For some reason, sometimes on uh, StreamYard, I can't see everybody in the chat room right away. But hello, Reverend Keith. Much love to you, my friend. And, uh, oh, yeah. I will tell that story, John. I will tell that story coming up. Hello, gorgeous Lala. Welcome back. And, oh, there's Reverend Keith. Thank you, my friend, for coming in. I love you, man. It's one of my spiritual gurus, Reverend Keith. And, uh, uh, what's the story about the Jaws doll behind me right here? Uh, I have a fear of sharks. Total fear of sharks. And Dirty Filth sent that to me. It scared me. 
Are you still there, uh, Lisa? Oh, you're on mute. There you are. I was laughing, so I was on oh, mute. Oh, no, you're allowed to laugh at me. That's okay. <laughs> I'm, la- I'm celebrating you, Dave. Oh, I'm nice. celebrating you. Nice. You're way too kind. Way too kind. Yeah, you're more than welcome to laugh at me. Everybody else does. I, I promote it. If we can't have fun, I, I don't mind being the uh, the fish in the barrel for that. Uh, Radagash the Grey, welcome to our channel. Um, Toe Tag, good to see you. Gorgeous Science Melinda. And uh, we're 15 seconds away from launching here. And uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, do us a favor, hit that subscribe button, ring the bell. We're here seven days a week. Let's rock out. We got three seconds. Let's do this. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire. You got uh, bu- uh, you got our swag to check out as well. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Author Lisa Broderick is here. Brand new book out called All the Time in the World. You can find it in any major bookstore and online. And Lisa, thank you so much for doing this. I just want to give out your website, allthetimebook.com, to teach us all about you. Really appreciate you being here and scaring the daylights out of me tonight. Really. You know, and I'll tell you why. All right. Okay, I hate, why? I hate growing old. I you don't like if that's I can't about. Well, I realize that. But you see, you know, here here's always been my theory, okay? When when I was 22, even before that, all right, my grandfather, who I absolutely idolized, all right, he always had a very old thinking. He always thought about the old days. It was all about, you know, he never moved forward in time, if mm-hmm. I can use that term. And he died at 70, very young. And I always remembered when at 22 he passed away, And I always remembered, you know, this saying, you know, I don't want to grow up because when you grow up, you grow old. And when you grow old, you die. And I have a complete fear of death. Even though I'm very spiritual, I do believe life continues on past this. What it is, I don't know. I hope what I think is correct. But I have a fear. And that is why I am so afraid and literally get major anxiety panic attacks about time and and growing old and seeing my children get older. I don't remember my nephews being teenagers. I, I remember them being small. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years ago, we go over to my parents' house uh, for Christmas and all my nephews are like, giants and in, in their <laughs> early 20s and 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 hanging on out and I'm like where did this come from I don't even <laughs> know these people like I'm I'm paranoid of it well your brain didn't take very many pictures because they were your nephews so that's one thing right you had a picture of them when they were small and then when they were older so that's that I will use something from the business world which is a little bit glib but fear false evidence appearing real Dave false evidence that is not true. Even time, even Einstein said time is an illusion. And the stories about what happens and what people experience are so profound when it comes to living life and life beyond life and all the, uh, all the other things we can experience. There's really no reason to be afraid. And I'll tell you stories about Please real do. experiences. Well, one story would be that is that my mother, she was very clinically minded. She was an economist and I was trained as as an economist as well at Stanford. And so economics is a study of human behavior, right? In order to take data and predict what the humans will do next. But it's very scientifically minded. 
And so at the end of her life, she had had, she had had cancer and we knew that she was very near death. And I said, and I was working on this book and I said, you know, mom, it's possible that you don't go anywhere when you die. And she said, Oh, you know, I don't know. I said, well, you know, they've, they've had these experiences and I didn't really share with her a lot of what I was thinking of. Cause I didn't think I would find, you know, friendly, friendly ears when I did that. But I said, you know, mom, maybe electricity is the easiest thing to manipulate. And maybe if you're, if we're all here, we knew she would die at home. We were there with her. My brother's a, a physician. And so we were home with her and she said, and I said, you know, just think about it. Give us a show. Give my brother a show, right? If you're on the other side and you can, she said, oh, I don't know. I said, well, just think about it. Well, she died that next morning, very early in the morning at 2 a.m. And uh, she, we were in her home and we didn't know there was no reason to call anyone. So we just stayed there and she stayed there too. And around 4 a.m. I was in her bedroom with my sister and I got this overwhelming feeling to leave, leave the bedroom. It was like, a thunderous energy about the room. So I got my sister up off the floor who was sleeping. I said, you know, come on, come on. We should go in the other room. We get to the other room and immediately the radio goes on next to my mother's body, full blast at 4 a.m. And my brother looks at me and he goes, I've been here for days. That radio has never gone on. So number one, the radio was not on a timer. We thought to ourselves, then the television was in the be- was in the living room. We weren't watching television. The television reset itself. It tried to turn on. No one was touching the television. And the television was suddenly turning on. So that's two data points. We were a little rattled, but then we went to sleep. And the next day, and they came and they took her body away. And we, we decided to drive to my brother's property, which was, you know, miles away in the Santa Cruz Mountains. We were there sitting and thinking about life. And it was hours and hours later. And he gets a call on his phone, a cell phone. And so they want to know why my mother's Medialert pendant is being depressed. Where is she? And my brother says, well, she's died. And the pendant is next to her, is, is on her bed, her bed stand. And the house is locked. Oh and it was depressed for 40 minutes. So he looks a little pale and looks at me. And I think to myself, you know, mom, you just gave us a show. Nothing and no one ever dies. That's the first law of thermodynamics, Dave. I'm surprised you don't remember your physics. Conservation of energy. If I had remembered my physics, I would have be retired with a, 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 a nice uh, retirement package from the Canadian Armed Forces by now. <laughs> but well so first law of thermodynamics conservation of energy no energy is is ever lost it's only trans transformed transmuted changed second law of thermodynamics entropy we observe that things are in a state of order and they grow to disorder they age grow de- die decay t- become different right but the truth is that Entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, is an observational law. It's not an immutable law. We observe that. But it's not, entropy is not a thing. It's an observation. What's behind the entropy? And here's the other thing about entropy, things growing, aging, and dying, you know, becoming more disordered. It's possible that that the opposite would happen, that the wine glass that you just shattered would put itself back together. It's possible that people go in the other directions, like the like the Benjamin Button story. It's extremely unlikely, but it is possible in physics. I remember when my 29-year-old nephew died in 2018. And much like your mother, we had some weird experiences. And my my nephew was a a young a young man who had a fentanyl problem. And he was in rehab when he broke down and it was a, things happen. But I remember going down there. I found out on a Wednesday or on a Thursday, Wednesday night. And I went down to my parents' house on that weekend. And my nephew, when he was coming down, stayed with my parents. And my mom used to tell me that, he would get up at about 4 o'clock every morning, walk to the kitchen to grab a glass of water, then he would open up the fridge, grab something to eat, then back to the sink to grab a glass of water, and then go back to bed. So on this particular night, I'm sleeping on my parents' couch 
which their their living room was right beside the kitchen. And at four o'clock in the morning, my parents always have this garbage can where they put their recyclables or this garbage bag tucked into a drawer where they put their recyclables. And that bag at four o'clock in the morning f- came crashing down to the floor on onto the uh, tile floor and spilled cans all over the place. Hmm. And I said to myself, I said to my nephew, I said, dude, really? I'm trying to sleep here. I just literally <laughs> fell asleep. Didn't hear Perfect anything. Reaction. But, but the cool part about it was um, later that, the, that next morning, we had to go and get his things. And if anybody's never done that before, that's one of the worst things in, I've ever gone through in my life. And I hope I don't have to do it again. But we, uh, so we go to the police station, pick up his stuff. Then we go to the rehab facility to pick up the remainder of his clothing and, and everything. And I take my sisters, including his mom. I said, let's try and find the park where he passed away. Cause he passed away on a picnic table in a beautiful park in Vancouver. Hmm. And so I, um, we're, I literally have no idea where this park is. And I remember saying to him telepathically or mentally, I said, tell me where the park is. But I called, I called my nephew, Stu. I said, tell me where this park is, Stu. And all of a sudden he says, take a right at the, I hear him in his voice say, take a right at the lights. So I take a right at the lights and be damned if the park isn't like 200 feet from that intersection. And as we're driving past this park, I see this beautiful uh, person, park caretaker driving on a John Deere ATV. And I quickly wave her down and I run, run across the street and I said, hey, ma'am, sorry to bug you. I said, there was a body found here last week and that was my nephew and I have his mother in my truck. Could you please tell me? Or do you know anything about this? And she literally drops her jaw, goes completely white, and she goes, my God, I was hoping to find somebody from the family because I'm the one who found him. Oh, my. I mean, that was completely set up by my nephew on the other side. And she, <laughs> and she took us she took us to the park, the exact same picnic table in the exact same spot and showed us how he was fell asleep and never woke up. Mm-hmm. And it was powerful. One of the most powerful moments of my life and that's all for my nephew. Wow. Well, that that's, that is a tremendous story. And so we wonder how these things happen, right? And we wonder how something like that could could creep over into our physical world of universes and cars and bodies and computers and things. But I have a theory about that. You want to hear it? I would love to. So imagine that everything is about time, right? There's matter and there's time. And so uh, we think about our universe and we talk about Uh, We think about waves, as has been famously said. If you want to understand the universe, you need to think about frequency and vibration. So let's talk phase and waves, right? So waves are electromagnetic. There's sound waves. There's light waves. There's even gravity waves. So there's all kinds of waves in our our world, in our universe. Now, phase, we hear that word. What does phase mean in physics? It means to synchronize something with something else. Okay, so imagine a sine wave. A sine wave is just a simple wave that goes up and down and up and down, repeating forever, same height, same low, right? Highs and lows. The, that's the amplitude, the height of it. But that occurs, the, the up and the down, you know, the height and the amplitude occurs over time, over an x-axis. So how frequently that happened is the frequency of the wave occurring over time. So let's take an easy wave. We'll take a sign, a, a sound wave. Imagine you have two perfectly tuned flutes. Okay. So one flute starts playing. It's perfectly tuned. It's playing one note. You hear that, right? It's generating sound waves. You can hear the sound waves because of the ways our, way our ears are constructed. Another perfectly t- tuned flute tuned to it starts to play the same note. Now for a moment, you would hear the second flute, wouldn't you? Yes. You would. But then what happens? Phase would synchronize them. 
they would be in phase. You would only hear one flute. But for a moment, you heard two, two flutes. So imagine your nephew and imagine my mother and imagine all of the other things we think of as paranormal, which are paranormal to us, are an experience of time, time and phase. Imagine something or someone is a little before or a little ahead or just plain better at manipulating time than we are. And it goes in and out of phase, which is why we might sometimes see things. We sense things. Things happen. But then it goes back into phase. Phase is synchronous with us. And then we go about our lives like nothing happened. This is a way to explain all of this phenomenon. The flutes. It's the perfectly tuned flutes in and out. It could even explain the existence and the, the, the sightings and experiences of extraterrestrials, right? That we sometimes see, but we don't see, and they're there, and they're not there, and we don't really know what's happening. Maybe aliens are just plain better at manipulating time than we are. I can see that, and I can appreciate that on an extraterrestrial level. For you, though, when we die... Are we just going to a different plane? Are we going to a heaven where there is no time? Because Earth is really the only place where time exists that we know well, of. Well, well, there's, there's time and space, right? So time passes in space. We know that because we know that black holes are real. And we know that time slows down the greater the gravity. I mean, there have been, we've gotten far enough out into space to know that time, movement is in outer space. Therefore, time is in outer space. And it's pretty much the same time on Earth, sidereal time, which is calculated based on the planets, is a little bit different than time on Earth, but it's not greatly different. What is greatly different is a great, a big gravitational body. Now that slows down time like a black hole. With that said, if time exists because things move around, and if the first law of thermodynamics holds, which is that nothing, that energy is never lost. It's simply conserved. It's changed into a different form. So imagine someone dies and leaves their body. And there's even a thought that the body is lighter upon death. I'm not sure that that's true, but some people believe that. That energy, that consciousness is somewhere. And think about the brain for a moment. The brain is a bunch of neurochemical interactions, but it's much more than the sum of the parts. That doesn't explain consciousness. And consciousness is an energy. A brain and consciousness are not the same things. The brain is much greater than the, the consciousness is much greater than the physical parts of the brain and the chemical reactions. So something's going on here. And so imagine the cor corporeal body can no longer support life, right? And then something happens with phase. It becomes another flute, a perfectly tuned flute. And it's here for a while. But also, Dave, you talk about dimensions, and I do want to get into to dimensions because I think this whole thing is a measurement problem. I think that we do not have the fine enough instruments and the greatest, the greater intellect and ability to measure things, including multiple dimensions beyond the 11 or 26 that some people believe exist in order to really know what's going on here. Okay. Now, one of the things that I've often thought, and I'm going to put it in a paranormal ex explanation here, mm -hmm. is I think that a lot of these ghosts are not ghosts or spirits at all. I think we're actually running into people on a different timeline. And let me give you my example with this, if you don't mind, as we've got about five and a half minutes to go here. I was on a ghost hunt one time, and I was touring some people around on the original Gold Rush Trail which is about three quarters of a mile from my studio here in British Columbia. And of course, the Gold Rush Trail, for people who don't understand, literally started in Nevada, California, made its way up through Oregon and Washington into British Columbia, and right through to Alaska and the Klondike. Long story short, we had nine people experience this. And we had nine K2 meters. And I, I don't care what anybody thinks about paranormal gear. That's not part of the purpose. But we had 9K2 meters that all lit up to bright red at the same time. And we started communicating with this spirit, realizing after asking questions that it was a husband and wife from China because there was a large Chinese community in central British Columbia mm -hmm. that was mining gold. And they were on their way to this place called Barkerville, where that town was. And from there... 
after communicating with them, we said, okay, thank you. And we said, you guys can go now. And the problem was none of the K2 meters went off. They all stayed at bright red. We couldn't figure out why they weren't leaving. And we said, you can go a number of times and rethink them. And then I realized that all nine of us were standing on the trail. So I started mm-hmm. taking my K2 meter and walking down the trail and realizing, okay, if it's a husband and wife, there's, there's likely horses behind them and a wagon. So I told everybody to kind of split up and go on both sides. And sure enough, as we split up, you see the back K2 meters start to turn off as the buggy and the horses and these people walked by until all K- all eight, nine of those K2 meters were off. Now, to me, I often wonder in that experience if we were actually ghosts in their timeline that they were seeing and communicating with or if they were truly ghosts at all and just people on a different dimension. Well, I'm with you on the different dimensions. So let's, we'll get back to science, right? Here's science. Science would say that only if something can be measured, is it real? Okay. Data point. If you have K2 meters, that's great, right? You're measuring something, but the, the accuracy, the fine ability of things to measure, you know, we can measure time down to a plank length, you know, in a plank second, but that's probably huge for what we'll measure in the future. So maybe your meters were able to measure this. I completely agree that it's a dimension issue. And so what are dimensions, right? Dimensions are the minimum number of measurements, right? That we need to specify something, the object of something, the latitude, the longitude, the altitude, the height, the width, the depth, all kinds of things, right? So imagine there are aspects of measurement that we don't know yet. And the shape of things in space, right, are determined by things and space isn't smooth and so unseen unmeasurable dimensions are out there and they're not accessible to our current physics they're not accessible to our current instruments but you happened upon an experience where they were you happened upon a timeline you happened into a different dimension if you will and dimension only means to measure so back to my statement before this may be a measurement problem it's a time it's a timeline problem meaning out of phase right? They're, they're slightly behind us in terms of time or ahead of us or way behind us. And then suddenly they get into phase and we may see them or not see them. And that's a dimension, right? That is an unmeasurable aspect of what we normally can't see, but we did see for a moment. So do you believe then when you hear of people seeing thunderbirds flying in the sky or claims of seeing dinosaurs running around do you believe that they're not looking into this timeline but a previous timeline that that the earth still hasn't forgotten again because it's a measurement issue and it's a perception issue there's also what one way that i i describe time in terms of our experience and that is time is one part physical and one part perception there's a physical component to it right time exists because we move around things move around, matter moves around. That's the physical part. The perception part is anyone's guess, right? It's the slowed down time of Wayne Gretzky. It's being in a different timeline. It's seeing something out of the corner of your eye and you're not quite sure that it's actually there. It's seeing something full on that you you are sure it was there but couldn't possibly be there. I think it's all of the above because the perception part is so open to the, the personal experiences that people have. Wow. I don't even know where to go with that. I really don't. I I think it's so fun. Imagine that all of this is real and it's our perception and we're just not able to measure it. Imagine, here's an example. Okay, a stream of water is being poured into a glass, right? To our eyes, it looks like a constant stream. But if you look closer under a microscope, right, you'd see that it's not a constant stream. It is billions and billions of water molecules bumping into each other in the most violent way imaginable as they fall into the glass. 1.5 sextillion water molecules are in a single drop. Imagine we're the drop. The earth is the drop. And on that note, we're going to head out to commercial break right now. Top of the hour, Lisa Broderick is here. We got her for another 90 minutes here on Spaced Out Radio. Time. Do you believe it's happening? Can we slow it down? Can we make life 
a lot more enjoyable. What about the aliens? Yes, around here we can still say aliens. Sorry, Demi. Spaced Out Radio, Hour 2, with author Lisa Broderick, returns right after this. All right, Lisa, so in Hour 2 here is when Mm -hmm. I start allowing some audience questions as well. Oh, fun. So uh, we don't take callers, but... They will ask questions in our chat rooms, and I'll read them to you. Okay, perfect. How are we doing? You enjoying it? Oh, uh, this is heavy. (laughs) And I and I mean that in the most dearest complimentary way. This is this is heavy. Like I could sit with you uh, and just chat about this for hours. (laughs) Wonderful. Okay, good. (laughs) Yeah, and and for a guy like me, like I'm not a real science guy. I'm I'm not a real big science guy. I, I never have been. It's never been my forte. But I'm learning here. And I could mm. and I and it's like I said, the whole trying to grasp the whole concept is is really, really hard for me, but it, it's challenging and I like that. Well, so imagine in the dimensions, Dave, that you don't go anywhere, right? And in fact, in out of body, people don't go anywhere. They see everything and they come back and they can report things. And that's even been been clinically studied. So this whole idea that nothing and no one ever dies, that's how I live my life. And I'm not afraid of death. You just sort of change. Hmm. And if nothing else, as my brother would say, the doctor, it's a great coping mechanism. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. I hear you there. Let's see here. Are you having fun? Oh, this is a blast. So fun. Wonderful. It is a little late for me, I will say. <clears throat> Got to get my beauty sleep. I have an early morning, but I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks so much for having me. I have to get my beauty sleep, too. We can call it the night right now if you want. No, I'm teasing. Oh, no. Wouldn't in the world. <laughs> yeah, we're having a good night here. Very good night. This is just awesome. Well, and we could do a little, do, does the audience like quantum mechanics? You know, entanglement, quantum consciousness. My audience is into everything. They are so brilliant. Okay. They are way more brilliant than I am. Oh, let's talk Penrose. You can go into anything you want. <laughs> As I say, for all the techies, trekkies, astrophysicists, Penrose groupies, and Feynman fans, this is for you. All right. Well, we have uh, three and a half minutes. So we get to just chill, relax, and scare the hell out of me. (laughs) No, after this, be much more, much more calm. So here, entropy, aging is an effect. It's not the cause. That's science, right? Mm -hmm. And so first and second law of thermodynamics. What what about genetics, though? What about genetics? Yeah, you know, I think it's a program. So you got a program on your computer, you can unlock it. You don't have to open the program. I do not think genetics are prescribed. I think it's a program that we unlock. Great. So you're saying if I would have unlocked it years ago, my I wouldn't have a Santa Claus beard right now. <laughs> Thank you. And how perception, right, can affect how we live our lives. True. Uh, I want to say a quick hello to the gorgeous Lynn Sows. Too much information. The lovely Char, and who else has joined us here into our number two? Uh, Brazelhoff, how are you? Glenn John McEnroe, the pride of Wimbledon. What's happening? All right. That's a good question, Michael. I will ask that when we come back. Um, I got a bunch of questions already lined up for you. <laughs> oh, good. Yes, my audience is getting ready to fire. <laughs> yeah, there's some brilliant questions here. Holy cow. <clears throat> I don't be mean to Lisa. I'm well-meaning and I'm a person of good intentions. Oh, bad questions never get through. 
<laughs> okay. Never get through. This is all journalistic integrity here. <laughs> if there is such a thing anymore. Thank you, mainstream media, for killing that. Yeah, things go in cycles. Oh, I know. I'll never forget my old news director saying it's not about the news anymore. It's about infotainment. I heard that statement for the first time in early 2002. I heard a statement right around then, which is, that story's too good to check. Yep. Yow. Yep. I really do believe, though, that um, Twitter really, really killed news. Yeah. It really did. Because the race to be first was more important than accuracy. Right. And that's what killed it. It all became about clickbait. Who can yeah, get and then it, it first? And then it, shaped, and then it shapes people. Oh, hugely. Sad. Hugely. We got less than a minute here. Okay. I want to say a big thank you to R&R, Dirt Road, Thomas, and Simon for the amazing Super Chats. Remember, people, the Super Chats are a great way to support what we do here on Spaced Out Radio on a nightly basis. So please, if you can, help us on out. We'd appreciate it. And if you can also support us by hitting that subscribe button, ringing that bell if you have it already. And don't forget, you can do a little shopping for some swag on our store at spacedoutradio.com. Yeah, uh, Solar Warden, my vape tonight is orange ice. So it tastes like oranges. Yes, oranges. All right. Here we go. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Let's kick off hour number two of Spaced Out Radio right now. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth, I want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Zigadine. Zengadine is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tonight we have author Lisa Broderick. And I'm telling you, this one is a brain teaser tonight. What do you think about time? She's got a brand new book out called All the Time in the World. Her website, allthetimebook.com. You can find her book in any major bookstore or online. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Dave, thanks for having me. It's been great. All right, let's kick things off here with a couple of audience questions, and we're going to get into the whole alien factor. Ooh. All right, let's do it. I want to start off with Sparkles in our SOR group on Facebook. She is asking, Lisa, I have experienced for years that there are fast time days and slow time days. Do you know what I mean? And if so, can you explain why or how this happens? I do know what you mean, and that is a great question. So here's a theory that I have, and that is our perception of time changes based on what and how, what we're focusing on and how we focus. That's why I have an exercise called focused perception. So imagine that one of those days where time passed very slowly, you were doing the equivalent of watching a clock with a second hand. How fast do you think that day would travel? It would be glacial right? But another day, right? You're not doing that. You're paying attention to nothing. Imagine the card deck with very few cards in it. You're taking very few memories. The day seems to fly by. It's what you focus on. In one instance, you're focusing on the clock with the second hand. On the second instance, you're focusing on uh, only a few cards in your card deck and time seems to fly by. If you want to slow down time, focus on something. 
if you want to speed up time, just go about your business and go from wake up in one wake up in the morning and close your eyes at night and the whole day will have happened in between. All right, let's move on to another question. Kim is asking, how are your days different because you do not believe in death? Well, scarce resources is a big issue. Think about that, right? So we live in a world and we have this belief that there's scarce resources. There won't be enough. And back to Dave and fear, you know, false evidence appearing real. So what if the resources that we have are, are, are good for our needs? With that said, of course, there's some people who are in dire need. But living in fear of scarce resources, I think, really affects our ability to lead the lives we want and to grow and dream and change and create, you know, an existence that follows our dreams. So we need to remove the fear, the false evidence appearing real, number one. And my fear of scarce resources was eliminated with the death experience, which is very common. I studied at the Monroe Institute, which is in Virginia Beach, Virginia, for expanded consciousness. And they study death quite extensively. It's one of the reasons I went there. And what they would say is when you've had these experiences, these sort of transcendent experiences, you realize that there are no scarce resources, that nothing and no one ever dies. In fact, your intellect increases, your ability increases, your emotional intellect increases, all kinds of things happen because you've sort of been unleashed. You've been unbridled by the slave slavery that we have to time and a belief that there are scarce resources, which, make, which makes you afraid. All right. Follow up from Kim. I want to know how to slow time down. Well, you could buy the book all the time in the world, right? Here's an easy way to do that. And that is focus perception. Again, take out a clock with a second hand. It does not work with digital clocks. Why? Our perception of time exists because things move around. Some, some digital uh, digit changing is not the same as a second hand moving. So if you focus on a clock with a second hand, do that. You can slow time down, but also the exercises in the book are designed to slow time down. And in fact, there's an exercise for you to slow down time on a clock or watch face until the second hand stops. That'll change your framework. Interesting. Nicola is asking, do you think CERN could have changed our timeline? Well, back to the multiverse. Here's the thing. The butterfly in the butterfly effect could have changed everybody's timeline. If the multiverse is true and it's a valid explanation for time and what's going on in the universe, that a new universe is birthed out of every moment. I call it the quantum ballet. Think of a ballet. It's a little bit chaotic and there's a lot of people on the screen. That's all of us humans and animals and plants and things doing things. Every action, every thought, every movement of everything is changing the ballet. And in a multiverse explanation, it's creating a new universe for an infinite number of parallel universes, all doing the ballet, all slightly different, but all moving forward in time. All right. The quick is asking, and I like this question, death is not a, how to die is boring. What if immortality is here and now? That's real for me. Well, immortality is here and now. My mother didn't go anywhere. I think that when your corporeal body dies, you don't go anywhere. You are out of phase. And you may actually be able to see people who are here. And everything and everyone who was here may be able to see everything and everyone that is here. And as Dave explained on the, on the trail, that occasionally we can see them, but they're all just on different timelines. I think you're absolutely right. Couldn't your critics ask you and, and, and say... Look, maybe you're still heartbroken over the loss of your mother, and that's the reason why you, you believe what you do? Well, since it started when I was four and my mom died uh, three or four years ago and I'm in my 50s, that would be unlikely. Okay. That's what happened. All right, Michael here, Michael Huntington, who's a former guest on this show, great paranormal investigator. He's asking if you had a chance to read any of Robert Bigelow's afterlife essay contest contributions that Bigelow put up $1.8 million for. No, I haven't. And I would be fascinated to. I've just learned of it now. And I'll make a note of that. All right. Good. 
Good. All right, let's get into some aliens here. Where do the extraterrestrials come into play when it comes to time and humanity? Well, so imagine the the uh, identical flutes, right? So identical flute, and, and so it's a wave, right? Light is a wave, and matter is a wave. Light, light becomes particles and waves, right, into matter in some sense. They're still working that out, why the relationship between light and patter, uh, light and matter, but light is a wave. And so imagine that all of this is really a wave, right? And so we're on a timeline that's a wave and people who die in the paranormal might be slightly different and they're out of phase, right? We might see them a little bit, but imagine aliens who are way more advanced than we are can manipulate it at will. They can manipulate a timeline. And quite frankly, imagine this. And actually, I got the story from good friends of mine in Los Angeles, Emily and her main squeeze, Chief Jim. They hipped me up to stories about uh, time travel, where if you could if you could travel back in time or forward in time, just a fraction of a second, would you still be on the same place on Earth? Well, of course, the answer is no. The Earth's moving. It's rotating and it's moving around the sun. And the sun's moving around the solar system and the solar system's moving around the galaxy. You'd be, you would disappear. If you could manipulate time, you would disappear. That explains a few things. If aliens are simply better at manipulating time in ways that we cannot, then it explains all of the sightings and all of the, all of the ideas and beliefs that they're here already. Wow. Interdimensional time travel is day time travelers day dave in ways that we cannot multiple dimensions and uh, that we have not yet discovered so do you they be- may be too big or too small to see but they may be there do you believe then that we are being visited by extraterrestrials or otherworldly phenomena and and the reason why i ask it that way is because in talking to people uh within the government regarding this subject, they claim that they don't know where these beings or craft are coming from. They don't know whether it's time travel. They don't know whether it's extra dimensional uh, portals from space. They're, they're unsure. What do you believe on that? Well, I'm, I'm scientifically minded. So let's take a scientific approach there are how many galaxies and how many planets in each galaxy and within the whole universe. And we are the only one in all of that trillions and trillions of instances which support life, even life on our M type uh, planet, M class planet. And we're the only ones who are sentient. Really? Now that's crazy. What isn't crazy is that life has evolved in the galaxy and in the universe and is in other galaxies. And it may be way further along than we are, especially with with respect to time. Because traveling across great distances, of course, one would grow old and die, presumably, if one couldn't manipulate time. But that wouldn't be true. And then let's get into wormholes, things in space that we know are true, right? Traveling across great distances. A wormhole, of course, your audience knows what that is, the Einstein-Rosen bridge, right? It's a phenomenon in space, and there's two holes, and it looks like a worm, and you go in one end and out the other. That's been scientifically studied and proven, you know, to the extent that we're proving these things in astrophysics. Well, if one of the mouths is accelerating, you would not only travel in space, you would travel in time. Think about that. So that's time travel right there. Maybe they know how to do that, and I'm sure we will. Okay. Oh, I'm just, yeah, I believe you. I'm going to tell you that. And I'm not trying to be snarky. I, I believe you on that. Well, I'm, uh, these are theories, right? I'm waiting for the, for the world and all the, all the wonderful discoveries where we can actually prove that this is true and grow to a new place. You know, Dave, considering the amazing complexity of the universe and time and matter and everything orchestrated and mathematics and how everything works together, how could it be possible that our existence doesn't go beyond Einstein, Galileo and even Einstein, Right. And how is it possible that there isn't a reality beyond which we can see if it's only a measurement problem? Our eyes are measuring. This suggests the quantum world, 
which many believe is the same world as the spiritual, which in everyday life is beyond what we understand as reality. Have you ever had an extraterrestrial experience or channeled? I've seen things which are out of phase, Dave, I have to say, which is how I came up with this theory. And that is out of the corner of your eye, you there's something. I was living in a, uh, my home in Arizona years ago, and which is alone, and I, I have an alarm in my home. And so there was no human in my home. And there was definitely a person who walked between two rooms. There was a form. And I was not hallucinating. But I know enough about these things to know that those types of experiences could be explained with what we're discussing. And that is there was a moment and there was a brainwave state. We should talk brain stuff later, brainwave states. There was a brainwave state I was in. I was awake. I was alert. I was standing in my kitchen. It was three o'clock in the morning. Someone moved around. The reason I have an alarm is so that I know it's not a person because I wouldn't be afraid of aliens. I'd be afraid of other people. And so it wasn't a person, but there was a form and it was a human form. It moved from, from one room to another in a way that I can't explain. Scientifically speaking, I would say that it was a parallel flute. The flute came into playing and began playing. And for a moment, I heard it. And then it was gone. Hmm. I'm going to get to a couple of questions from my good friend, Eugene, who is a, an incredible author in his own right about the near-death experience, and he believes he solved the riddle as well. He's asking, we know how to bend time, but how can we travel through time? Well, we just explained the Einstein-Rosen bridge, right? Where one of the mouths of the wormhole could be, if it were accelerating, theoretically, we're not sure anyone has done it, right? But theoretically speaking, if one of the mouths of the wormhole were moving, accelerating, then you would move through time. That's one way. And that's scientifically valid. His follow-up question is, which taught you more, academic or spiritual studies? Well, I wouldn't say it's academic, but when this started to happen, I did go back to the ancient texts, the mystery, the history of the mystery. It just struck me that with all of the knowledge in the world, there was something that happened a long time ago where the ancient Indians, as in India, knew that the earth revolved around the sun, not the other way around, right? And so there was tremendous wisdom that was somehow lost. I thought maybe the experiences I was having could be explained with these ancient texts. And so I studied Kabbalah and Chinese and India and Buddhism and Sufism and all of these ancient traditions to learn about things. So in that way, that was academia, but that was my own reading but in academia, I did study quantum mechanics, which is tremendously mind expanding. If you compare Buddhism and quantum mechanics, the Buddhists in their ancient texts were talking about quantum mechanics. That's actually been studied. And it's mind blowing when you see the parallels. Holy. I never knew that. Yep, David Bohm. A lot of the ancient, a lot of the uh, original uh, quantum physicists were study these ancient texts, and in particular Buddhism, for that reason. Hmm. So, does that mean that they were more advanced back then than we are now when it comes to science and physics? Well, back to the, are we the only life in the universe? So imagine this, how long, how, how old is the earth? <laughs> right? Pretty old. And only, and how old is man in our current incarnation? You know, a couple thousand years. So what happened before? We were just blobs in the pr primordial soup. I don't buy it. Something else happened. Maybe there's a rise and a fall of mankind that comes and goes over millennia and millennia. And sometimes some of that wisdom is carried forward either in a person or an artifact or something survives and it, it comes through and it accrues over time. And if you look at these ancient texts, you find quite surprising things. Again, the, all the, the original uh, quantum physicists were pretty hip to this, the spiritual aspect of their work for this reason. Okay. So back to extraterrestrials here for a moment, because they have the ability to bend time and use wormholes? Do you believe that 
they have the ability to travel at well over light speed through wormholes to get here from far off distances millions of light years away well so dave back to the measurement problem okay the speed of light right the universe's speed limit how we came up with it who knows but it's there speed limit right so what is one thing in science that we know for a fact travels faster than the speed of light everybody think 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 quantum entanglement it's real so the quantum entanglement it states that two particles can instantly communicate with one another, even across cosmic distances. Now, it's bizarre, it's, un, it's unexplainable, and it challenges our belief that nothing can, fa- can travel faster than light. But it's real. Quantum entanglement has been proven for a particle that was on Earth and in outer space at the same time, instantly communicating with each other. And of course, it's quantum entanglement. So it's exhibiting a characteristic like spin. You know, it's not something we could see with our eyes. With that said, scientifically proven and get this, it's getting into our bigger world. In Physics Today magazine, just two months ago, was a story about quantum entanglement in our big world of universes and cars and matter, where they are determining that quantum entanglement exists in our world today. So if we're just discovering that and extraterrestrials are more advanced than we are, of course they can go faster than the speed of light. We're already we're already beginning to uncover that on Earth. Do you believe extraterrestrials walk among us? I believe I have seen things like the person in my house and in other things. And when people say that they see things, I absolutely believe them. Because the number of things that happen, I'll tell you stories. So I am doing this work. If I drop a wine glass, let's say, and I am and I catch myself in terms of my perception, I can see it in slow motion and catch it by the stem. Now, that's a parlor trick on earth, but it's manipulating time. If I can do it with my feeble self and my little human existence, imagine what civilizations who are far more advanced than we are, can do. And could they be here and be a parallel flute, right? Be a flute that is playing the same note and they're here and they're not here? Absolutely they could. Hmm. So do you believe that there are different species of extraterrestrials that have been able to come here and and find out what we're all about? Because we are literally, because our planet is so loud, due to electronics and noise and light pollution and everything that we are projecting way out into the universe that would attract visitors to to come over here. Yeah, you know, we may be the nursery school. In fact, we may be the bad boy nursery school of the universe or the galaxy, right? Those earthlings, they're making a lot of noise. They're pretty young. They're making some mistakes. And I'm sure, you know, if the if ETs are out there and they can travel to visit us, they might, might want to know what's going on. We could certainly use all the help we can get. Hmm. We've got just under 90 seconds here before we got to go to break. At the bottom of the hour, author Lisa Broderick is with us talking about time tonight. What about time travel? Time travel, Einstein, Rosen Bridges, I'm telling you. And also phase and the other aspect, the other things we talked about for time travel. That is something that we will crack. For sure. We can talk about that in the next segment. That is one of the most intriguing topics ever. Ever. Well, it fascinates people. And think about the fictional stories, manipulating time, traveling time, things I cover in my book, but the things in the book are very real. It's only a matter of time. Well, the nice pun there. Very nice pun there. (laughs) The time puns are infinite. Another time pun. I like it. (laughs) I like it. We are having a blast here. And it's not very often I I get shut up because I'm kind of a big mouth. And you're making me shut up and think a lot tonight. So I appreciate that. Well, I hope you're having fun, Dave. I am. I am. I I mean, it's it's hard to fathom. You know, so, well, wrapping our minds around it. Here's what I want to do. Let's get let's practice while we're still in nursery school. You know, and the universe is looking at us. Let's get some practice in. Let's manipulate time. All right. Let's figure out how to do that when we come back on Spaced Out Radio. Our guest tonight, 
author Lisa Broderick. She has a great book out, All the Time in the World. It can be found at any major bookstore. It can be found online, places like Amazon. And her website, allthetimebook.com. I'll be honest with you, you can't see her on camera on YouTube and Twitch tonight, but she has fantastic hair too. So we appreciate that about Lisa. We'll be back with more Spaced Out Radio and Time right after this. All right, we're clear. Wonderful. Okay, that's a blast. You having fun playing with my mind yet? <laughs> Expanding your mind. You should think of something new every day, right? Then you won't be afraid of, of aging. Aging is only entropy that's going one direction. Just reverse it and do it the other direction. It's possible. The wine glass can put itself together. When it's you, improbable. When you talked about wormholes and I kind of snickered and laughed, I want to, I want to explain why. Uh, when I started having my own experiences... Uh, I never knew what channeling was. And I ended up uh, learning how to channel without even knowing really what it was. Mm -hmm. So my friend Samantha Mowat came over to my house one day. And she wanted to help me practice with my channeling. So she is very connected to extraterrestrials. And she goes, okay. <clears throat> she goes, I want you to... Find me the planet Lyra in the Pleiades. So I'm like, okay. So I ended up going on this channeling session. Hmm. And I remember zooming up. It's all black and I can see stars. And all of a sudden I kind of, like, like Google Earth, you kind of zoom in on what you're seeing. And mm -hmm. I was explaining this really giant, like, five-mile high tower. It was all very like aquamarine color and every corner of this building and every window was covered in gold. I never saw any beings or anything like that. And then when you mention wormholes, when they, whoever they are, started bringing me back, it was just like out of a Star Trek television show where they go through the wormhole that, you know, you see all the stars and all of a sudden they become like this light tunnel. Right. I went through that. And my neck started straining from the, the G-forces. And I remember grinding my teeth. And then, boom, I w in a split second, I was back here in my body. And I started coughing. I mm. And I coughed so hard that I bruised my, my throat and my entire chest cavity. Wow. And it, it was so painful that two days later, I actually thought I was having a heart attack. And I actually went to emergency to find out what was going on. The pain in my chest was so painful. Ooh, and wow. my family doctor happened to be working in emergency that day. And he goes, what did you do? He goes, because after x-rays, my chest was all bruised internally and I said doc you wouldn't believe me he goes try me so I told him and he goes you're right I don't believe you <laughs> I said I told you <laughs> right and so when you brought up the wormhole and how quickly it can happen it just brought back that memory and in and reminder of that night with Samantha well, we have these experiences. You know what I say, and that is don't just have them and then pick yourself up and dust yourself off and go on like nothing happened. That's not scientific. Make a note. It's, it's a parallel flute. It's out of phase. Keep a journal. How I learned to do all this is I wrote it down. I wrote it down and I went back to the last time that I, opened, that I turned on a big lighter and a 12-inch flame, flame came out of it, which is impossible. And all of the other things that started to happen, and I, I put the pieces together. We can each do that. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> yes. So I encourage you to channel and find out about those light tubes. 
It's kind of cool. Well, and so we could talk Penrose, which are microtubules in the brain. That's actually quantum consciousness. It might be the same thing. Maybe. Maybe. We could Maybe. bring up quantum consciousness. Great word. Mm. Mm. And Penrose up. just won the Nobel Prize. He's a serious cat. We can do that. We can definitely do that. We can definitely do that. We have about uh, 20 seconds, 25 seconds. A big thank you to Lynn Sows, R&R, Dirt Road, Thomas, and Simon for the amazing Super Chats tonight. Thank you so much for everybody supporting our show with the Super Chats. It goes a long way in what we do. Thank you to everybody who's been shopping at our store on our website, spacedoutradio.com, for your swag. We're going to be adding more soon, I promise. And a big thank you to all our new listeners. Don't forget to hit subscribe and ring that bell. Here we go, everyone. Past the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for being here. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with author Lisa Broderick. She has a brand new book out called All the Time in the World. So if you worry about time like I do, she says, we're nonsense. Stop thinking like that. Get her book, check it on out. She'll slow it all down for you in a very good read. All the time in book.com, all the time book.com, pardon me, is the website. You can find her book pretty much everywhere, like every major bookstore. Lisa, welcome back. Dave, thanks for having me. Time travel. This is time where, travel. Do you believe that it, it is possible? Do you believe that maybe it's already here and we do not know? What's your thoughts? Okay, we'll get into a little science because I know the audience likes it. Okay, even Einstein, right, uh, d talked about time travel, going back to the one, one of the big thinkers. So some think that time travel is physically possible. Scientists think that time travel is theoretically possible. We talked about wormholes, right? Yes. It's been known for a long time. Here's a fun fact, that the laws of physics work just as well in the forward direction as they do in the backward direction. So that's a, that's a, you know, it's a data point. And that is if the laws of physics that govern the universe work just as well forward or backwards in terms of mathematical equations, let's hold that in our minds. Now let's talk about matter. In the 1940s, Richard Feynman, very famous physicist showed that antimatter, which is a real concept in physics, right? Is identical mathematically to ordinary matter traveling backward in time for which he earned the Nobel Prize. Okay, so we have some fun facts going here. Einstein, time travel, right? Uh, formulas going forward and backwards. The, the guy, Richard Feynman, one of the most famous scientists with his antimatter and time traveling backward. So time travel may be possible, but how would it work, right? It works in certain general relativity. So we're talking Einstein, space-time geometries, we'll call it, right? How, or how, how space is out there which would permit faster than time travel speeds, right? And one of those, as we mentioned, was wormholes. So this is the most scientifically valid explanation that we have. Wormholes connect two points in space-time, right? Think of space-time as it's not flat, right? But it's, there's two points in space and it's three-dimensional. It means if they connect, if wormholes connect two points in space-time in this fabric of space, it means that they would, in principle, allow time travel as well as space travel, right? And so a way to convert a wormhole, which exists, into a time travel wormhole 
would be to accelerate one of its two mouths. If it were moving while the other one was stationary, if that were the case, then theoretically you would travel into one end of the wormhole and out the other end at a different point in time. That's time travel. So do you believe then that we already have this ability to do it? Because many people believe that we have. There's rumors and stories out there about, you know, time travelers already going back into time, whether you believe Andrew Bashago and people of that ilk or not, that's really your choice. Do you believe in, in the fact that maybe we've already done this? We may have, but there are many theories of time, right? And one of them is, we've talked a lot about the multiverse, great theory of time. So what about the block universe of time, right? You know what that is? No. So imagine you're, you're looking down, right, from above, from wherever it is above, and every moment in time is a block. It's a block. And so you're looking down at a block of time, and you could go from one to another block theory of time. That's why it's called that, Right. And then when you get to time travel, is there only one timeline? Does the universe resolve into one timeline? Or if you went back and killed your grandfather in the grandfather paradox, would you not be here now? Or would you be here because there's a multiverse? So time travel may well be possible, but we haven't even worked out what our theory of time is first. And so I think when we get to that that we'll be able to really understand time travel. My personal view is one that time is, it is it, it occurs in discrete moments, right? It occurs discreetly. And so when you talk about discreetly, you talk about a moment in time. And spiritually, there's only the now. So there's only the now, and we're dealing with the now, right? Right this moment, right? But when we go, when we talk about how time might work, Think back to the glass of water explanation, right? So the example of water being poured into a glass, to our eye, it looks like a stream. Imagine that stream is reality. But imagine that each molecule of water is a block of time. And they're, they're bumping into one another and they're jumbling, but you could plug into one or another. And that actually explains my favorite theory, which is called loop quantum gravity, Carlo Rovelli a very, very hip physicist who talks about time and explains that time may be um, a not continuous, but a, a fabric in space time where if everything were a particle, if, if every bit of time were a particle, you could theoretically move from one particle to another, jump from one to another, in which case you could time travel pretty easily. All right, let's get to some audience questions here. Vinman is asking, talking about time, why is it that dogs are the only creature that ages faster than any other Earth creature? Dog years, seven plus, any thoughts on this? Well, I think cats age too. And so I would think that that's more of a biological. Remember the theory of time, my formula? Time is one part physical and one part perception. I don't think that we can get away from the physical component of time because time exists because matter is moving around. So a biological entity that is experiencing entropy, first law of thermodynamics, which is things go from order to disorder, things grow, age, and die, is if, if one biological entity experiences that more quickly, then I think that that is just that's the, the makeup of their particular biology. I don't think that necessarily has to do with time. That makes sense. What about human time? Because, I mean, for a lot of us, like me, we feel pretty ripped off that, you know, the average age is 85 years old. That doesn't seem like a lot of time. Well, back to the measurement problem. Imagine we're just so limited in our ability to measure. And back to the story of my mother, and the story of your nephew. If what happens when we have a corporeal body and the corporeal body is no longer is able to support life, and we're suddenly out of phase, right? We're in a different time dimension. We may be able to see who's here. We may not. 
but that which animates or animated the individual in the first place, that sum total of consciousness, which is much greater than the neural processes in the brain, still exists, which means your 80 years is an illusion. It has no bearing whatsoever. It does when you stop breathing. <laughs> well, maybe when you stop breathing, you start doing something else. On the different timeline, remember on the trail, Dave, who were those I people? I know. I know. And I can feel you kicking my ass as you say that. I can, to <laughs> I can totally I'll simply feel point that. out the things that you already said. I know. I know. I'll just bite my tongue here and shut up. You know, Rob is asking, isn't a moment about five to seven seconds at a time? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure how I would define a moment. And so the uh, back to the measurement problem, the smallest unit we, we have can identify so far is a Planck, right? Named after the scientist Planck. So there's a Planck second and there's a Planck length. And so there's also a, a, Zepto, a Zepto second, I believe. And that is actually a bigger, a little bigger than a Planck. But I'm not sure what a moment would be defined as. All right. In regards to Penrose, for people who may not understand who or what Penrose is all about, please explain. Roger Penrose, again, as I was talking to you on the break. So for all of you techies, trekkies, astrophysicists, Feynman fans, and Penrose groupies, I mean, this is the hottest in science. Roger Penrose, a physicist, classical physicist, quantum physicist, just won the Nobel Prize. And he has a theory of quantum consciousness. Okay, and we'll talk tubules. So in the brain, the fabulous computer that is the brain where these neurochemical processes are going on, but consciousness is different from them. He supposes that it's quantum processes that are going on in the brain. And there's something called microtubules and it's pretty technical. You could look it up online, but there's a special pattern in the brain which enables quantum processes to, to occur. Now let's talk quantum. We're talking consciousness causes collapse, quantum entanglement, right? The um, uh, quantum superposition where something is both here and there at the same time. He supposes all of this is going on in the brain. And so it's neither two-dimensional or three-dimensional. It's another dimension, Dave, just like we spoke about. So quantum processes are things like absorption and emission, but on a level we can't see but using a model called in, that is quantum mechanics. I think it is a great, great uh, movement in the right direction to understanding what's really going on here. Okay. So does it always come down to the quantum field? Because I think for the majority of people on this planet, we have no clue what we're talking about when it comes to anything quantum. Yeah, and that's too bad. So it, it's as though there's this there's this big world of asteroids and planets and universes and cars and trucks and people and bears where I live, all kinds of things that are big and that we can see our big world. And then there's this tiny world, the micro world, the quantum world, where a quantum isn't even a quanta, a quanta isn't even a thing. It's a unit of measurement, right? Quantized. So and it's it is only modeled mathematically. No one's ever seen a quanta. With that said, Dave, the quantum world is running the computers that we're on now. It allows for lasers. It allows for all kinds of things that are in our everyday world. So that's one thing. We really couldn't live without it, right? Quantum computing, all of the things that are going on. But also that tiny world, I believe, is bubbling up as we're, ba as we're able to measure better. Remember the article I said I told you about in Physics Today, where they're measuring quantum entanglement in the big world? It's like there's a secret tiny little world that's going to burst through because we can measure it better because our big instruments are getting smaller and smaller and more precise where we can actually experience the quantum world in our big world. And I think that's what's going on when we experience these time shifts. Hmm. All right. Tony has a question for you. Lisa, what quantum UFO observation technique? I don't understand this question, Tony. Could you ask Lisa what quantum UFO observation? Oh, okay. Can you define what quantum UFO observation technique is? I haven't heard that term before. So if you're coining it today, kudos for you. It's the Tony theorem. With that said, I don't know that there is a quantum uh, 
uh, UFO identification technique that I'm familiar with. I'd love to hear about it. All right. Rob is asking, what do you know about conscious refreshing? Apparently it refreshes every 30 milliseconds, according to Persinger. So that's the, your consciousness is refreshing. That may be, think about consciousness again and thinking about the brain. The brain is a set of neurochemical processes in an organ. Consciousness is different than that. Many theories, you have, you have Penrose's theory of consciousness, you have consciousness is everywhere at once and we're swimming in it and it goes in and out of the brain. It may be refreshing, it may not. I really haven't, uh, haven't thought about that as a theory. With everything around our planet that revolves around time, we see clocks everywhere. Every sporting event has a time limit, except for baseball. We see everything controlled by a clock or, or some sort of formula of time. How do we put it to rest? How do we get it out of our head in order to think for ourselves in a free world? Well, I don't wear a watch, that's for sure. And in fact, a funny story, and I've heard other people say it, when I do wear a watch, it tends to stop, and it really shouldn't stop. So that's an interesting experience. Watches are not that useful for me, except as de decorative jewelry. And clocks around the house, they're useful, but I see them as a utility. When I'm doing the type of work that I do to slow down and change time for myself during my day, Doing what you do, Dave, I pack way more into a day than human beings really should or could in some sense by doing the types of time slowing down techniques that we talk about. And so I leave clocks out of the equation. Here's something to think about, as we said earlier. Pull yourself out of time. Step out of time. When you step out of time, imagine you're on a, a desert island with no clocks. Do you really know what time it is? So now we're going to quote Chicago. Does anybody really know what time it is? Does anybody care? No. Step out of time. You don't need to be a slave to time. Isn't that what Vegas is all about? It is. And that it's, it is a timeless environment. There's no setting of the sun, right? You're in an environment. They, it's intentionally that way, actually, in order to have you lose your sense of time so that you may be at a slot machine for, you would think, 30 minutes and three and a half hours have gone by and you've, you know, lost $2,000. That is a, it's a technique where they remove time from the equ equation. What about missing time? This is something uh, you brought up earlier. Regarding, oh, I think that's fascinating. You know, because I've never had missing time. I know people who have. There's people in our chat room who have had missing time. I've had time skip on me, which is extremely weird on its own. Happened at the same intersection, one going west, one going east, a few months apart. And literally, I watched the light turn green. I hit my gas pedal, and all of a sudden, I hear honking. And there are cars from the other way going toward or coming towards me because I ran a red light. Oh, well, that's actually that would be very similar to the some of the stories that I can share as well of missing time. And that may be a, the multiverse at work. So here's a story of missing time. Friend of mine, he decided to build a house out of straw hay bales. And he was driving on a highway in California, pulling way too much uh, tonnage for his vehicle. And it was broad daylight on Highway 5, and the truck jackknifed, and he began to swerve and spin. And as he spun out of control, time slowed down. I believe that time often slows down when we are in grave danger. It's a brainwave state, which we can talk about in a minute. Time slowed down greatly for him, and then he lost all sense of time. He came to, in the truck, perfectly intact, pointed in the same direction as traffic, with the truckers waving at him high-fiving him for whatever he had done. He had no, no memory of it. Now, in a multiverse explanation, he died. He crashed. He's gone. He went to a new universe where we are here too. He skipped into, a new multi, into the multiverse, parallel universe. He's dead in the other universe, and he's here now and going on like nothing happened. That's, those stories of lost time are, they abound. And here's the other thing. Many times they, they exist when people, quote, should have died. They should not be here. Things have happened where 
the the physical circumstances of what would happen would tear apart and kill a human body, and they didn't. In fact, there wasn't a scratch on them. Is that what we would call a miracle? I would call it a multiverse. Miracles, miracles may simply be a measurement problem, Dave. We call something a miracle, you know? So if we were back and King Solomon were in my house, he would call this house a miracle. My gosh, lights come out of bulbs and water comes out of the wall and all kinds of things happen. Those are miracles, but it's simply a measurement problem. It's an awareness problem. So what we can't measure yet, we may call a miracle, but it may be all understandable if we think about it in terms of dimension and time. Interesting. All right, let's go to Eugene. How does time intersect space or intersect with space? Pardon me. Well, you don't. So that's that it back to dimensions, right? Dimensions are things we can measure. They refer to the minimum number of things we need to measure something. So if you're going to measure the position of an object, right? You need the latitude, the longitude and, uh, the latitude, the altitude, and the longitude. So you have space time because all of that can't exist without time. And that's basically the the basis of Einstein who coined the phrase space time. How could you measure something in terms of latitude, longitude, and altitude to pinpoint its position without the fourth dimension of time? How would you get there? How would there be a universe without time? I was once asked, how would you explain to an alien what is time on earth? And my answer was, how did the alien get here? (laughs) There was change. The alien is not two dimensional. If they're three dimensional, then time is involved. Very cool. Space time. Very cool. Thank you for explaining that. Really appreciate it. Now in our chat room, I know I missed some questions For our our guest, Lisa Broderick, please retype them. I appreciate that. Let's go to David here, and he is asking, if photons compress space and time to zero at the speed of light, does that mean the atom that emits the photon and the atom that absorbs that same photon are touching? Well, it's a great question. I don't know. At that level, back to it, and I I hate, I'm sorry if it's a catch-all answer, but I really think it's the key to everything we're talking about, and that is it's a measurement problem. To be able to see them touching, to be able to measure something that small with our big microscope, imagine the drops of water, right? You have in a single drop of water, 1.5 sextillion (laughs) molecules in that single drop of water. I just don't think we have the ability to measure yet. So the answer is, I don't know. It's a good, honest answer. <laughs> I like Andrew in the UK. So here, here's a little humor for you. Okay. We've got a couple minutes left. He says, Dave, MC Hammer says, hammer time. Is this a real thing? Hammer time. I think hammer time is what you make it. Of course, it's a real thing. Here's something to go to sleep on. When you master time, you master yourself. I'd say hammer mastered himself. Especially with those baggy pants. <laughs> big ufo guy too really mc hammer yes very big into ufos that's all i can add that's all i can there, there's my knowledge for the night and lisa's like really dave really? <laughs> we, we talked to mc hammer tonight like my gosh we got about a minute to go here before we have to go to break at the top of the hour author lisa broderick is our guest tonight with time and missing time, do you believe then that missing time could be created out of our mind where we're put in some sort of lapse or are extraterrestrials really taking people? Yeah, you know, I don't tend to, to subscribe to things that might make people feel afraid, right? And so taking people and all of that, I don't ascribe malevolence to anything really. I mean, if someone comes at me with a gun, then I might think twice. With that said, the existence of other of other races and individuals and 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 extraterrestrials who might be curious about us, I'm in, I'm down for arrival, a good alien visitation, you know, of the octopad who just wants to talk to us. That would be my version of that, and they're not taking anyone. All right, that's a great answer. As we head into 
our break at the top of the hour. Two hours down. We got one to go. The next half hour, author Lisa Broderick will continue to join us. Then when we get to the bottom of hour number three, the fedora-wearing John Hudson will be back with the unbiased UFO report. And, of course, we'll have Shirky Poo's news and the thought of the Dave. Lisa Broderick has a brand new book out called All the Time in the World. Apparently, it could teach us to slow down time. It is anti-aging for your eyes. Allthetimebook.com is the website. You'll find it at any major bookstore. We'll be back with Hour 3 next on Space Down Radio. And we're clear. How are we doing? Fantastic. <laughs> You've stumped me so many times tonight. Well, I don't mean to. It's just, it's it's a mind bender. It's a good one, though. Get everybody it thinking. Is. It is. More thinking, more expansive thought. Right? The possibilities. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. And less fear, right? When we understand something, then we're not afraid of it. True. True. So I'll help you understand that you don't go anywhere when your body dies. It actually would be good. Do you know of the Monroe Institute? Dave? Yes. Yeah, you might want to go and and study with Bill Buellman, who's actually a friend of mine. He endorsed the book. The number one out-of-body teacher on the planet. Really great guy. And um, he he knows nothing and no one ever dies. He teaches people how to do it right there at the Monroe Institute. Wow. That's a brain. That's a, that is definitely a mind expander. That hurts. <laughs> no, it wouldn't hurt. It would be something. Yes, if I had the time, I would. Create the time. Here's what you do. You see it already done. These are the exercises in the book. That's how you speed up time. When you need to do something really big, you just you do it. The you, you use the perception exercise that's in the book called focus perception, and you live the experience of it already being done. And then you and then when you begin it. You go into the zone, and then by the time you look up, it's all done at exactly the moment you need it done. So you believe in moments, not time. Well, a moment is a colloquialism of what time is, right? I don't even blink, believe that a plank second is uh, is a measurement of time that that we're not going to exceed. It's just the smallest we could do now. It used to be we could only measure a foot, Dave, in the Middle Ages, Right, we're measuring certainly something smaller than a foot today. True. Well, just keep keep working on the measurement problem so we can identify the second flute. Hmm. Hmm. You are hurting my brain tonight. <laughs> hurting my brain, but that's okay. It's well worth it. A good thing. It is a good thing. Expanding your brain. Yes. I'm going to be going to bed early after this show. All because of this. <laughs> it's going to be your fault. Sweet dreams. Up at three. Actually, I was in, I lived in Sedona for a couple of years. And all the spiritual teachers, we always joked that we would call each other at 3 a.m. Because we, we were all up. Everybody was up. Everybody's up at 3 a.m. local time. Doing stuff. Doing stuff like this. My goodness. How do you not get worn out? I do a lot of self-care. I'm a, I'm a very um, uh, consistent meditator, very deep meditation, and twice a day. And also, so I, I sleep from 11 to 3, and then I'm um, up from 3 to 6, and then I don't have anything too early. Tomorrow I have a meeting at 8, kind of a bummer. So, you know, that's enough. And then I remove fear from the equation. If I have to do something big, I see it already done, and then I just just sort of magically happens. And uh, you know, take care of myself. 
and I don't live, I don't live in fear. That would be probably the biggest one. Just remove it from our, unless someone has a loaded gun at your temple, they're pulling the trigger and you know that every chamber has a bullet in it. You're not in danger. That's called an (laughs) ex-wife. That's real danger. Everything else is false evidence appearing real. True. Very true. I got to try some of this stuff. Yeah. I'm good. I'm good with this type of woo. Well, and talk about focus perception. We should get into that brainwave states, focus perception, why it's like hypnosis, what you can do in this state. A lot of fun stuff. Can do. We got about uh, uh, two minutes. When we get to the next break, Mm -hmm. uh, I'll say goodnight to you during the show, but I'll give you a proper goodnight uh, during the break. So just hold on for a minute or two after, okay? Perfect. I'd love to. Thanks so much. No problem. I've I've really, really learned a lot tonight. I appreciate you. I appreciate that. Well, thank you. It has been a lot of fun. And I I said this earlier in an interview. Imagine if in Starbucks you walked in and everybody was talking about this stuff. And not about all the other stuff that weigh us down and concerns everybody and divides everybody. Let's talk about all the wonderful things we can do. Mm -hmm. Good. That's what we try to do. It is. All right. I want to say a big thank you to Todd Purden, Lynn Sows, R&R, Dirt Road, Thomas, and Simon for the wonderful Super Chats tonight. Thank you so much for supporting Spaced Out Radio. We really do appreciate what you do. And a big thank you to all our new subscribers tuning us in, maybe for the first time. We really do appreciate it. And to all our regulars, very cool of you to see you all here again. Thank you so much. Here we go, everyone. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio just do me the favor hit that subscribe button we say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around north america and digitally on talk stream live revolution radio and kpnl the desert clam has set the password for tonight in the sor space travelers club zigadine zigadine is your password Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag, follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we say hello to Lisa Broderick. She is the author of a brand new book, called All the Time in the World. This is where we look at the scientific side of slowing time down and taking advantage of every second that we have on this beautiful planet before we are called elsewhere to who knows where. You can find her book in any major bookstore or on her website, allthetimebook.com. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us tonight. (laughs) Dave, thank you. It's great to be here. It is. Starting off with a question from Tony. Lisa, could you please give an explanation of quantum healing technique? Well, I haven't heard that term, but I can definitely combine the two. So we think about quantum mechanics, right? And we think about the the primary tenet of quantum mechanics, the observer effect, right? And so quantum science basically says that when observers show up to a situation, physical reality is altered, right? So we'll accept that. Now imagine if we wanted to apply that to healing, right? So healing is the mystery of the ages, but so is quantum mechanics, but it's also the latest science. So imagine that we could use our knowledge that 
uh, quantum science says that how we show up for a situation affects physical, uh, alters physical reality with the observer effect to, to affect healing on ourselves or others and to do it across space time using quantum entanglement. So imagine that we weren't so limited in our belief and we believed that, let's say prayer worked. And in fact, what is prayer? It's a long distance intention for healing of something in some sense, right? So imagine that's not a spiritual definition, but it's a scientific explanation for a phenomenon, which is quantum entanglement. Thinking about the health of another, using imagery to do it. Imagery is the observer effect in action, where psychology is meeting physics in the quantum field. Imagine a healing for someone else over space-time, across cosmic distances, so that someone else may benefit. I would think that would explains quantum healing, and I would think that it's very, very possible, and we do it all the time for people. All right, another question. This one coming from Nicole. What is your explanation of poltergeist activity then? Well, back to the fa- back to phase, right? So we talked about phase, how we might see something and then not see it. So again, we have sine waves, right? Everything is a wave. Of, so light is a wave and sound is a wave. Imagine that we're seeing something out of the corner of our eye, but it's the second flute. So one flute is playing and there are two perfectly tuned flutes. If a second flute comes in, you're going to hear the flute for a moment. And then they're going to go into phase. They're going to synchronize. Sound waves always do if they're perfectly tuned. When they're perfectly tuned, you don't see it anymore, but you saw it for a moment. That may well be poltergeist activity, what you saw for a moment. All right. I love this question by Jenny. It's kind of eerie. She says, I had an episode driving at night. All of a sudden, I saw a concrete wall in front of me. I jerked the steering wheel, and it was gone. I realized it was never there. What was that? Well, it could be a multiverse, and I'll I'll share something with you, Jenny. I had a similar experience, except it was broad daylight and rush hour traffic in Florida, driving pretty much too fast for all of rush hour traffic. We were all doing about 70. And in front of me, I saw a bicycle fall off a trailer in front of my car, and I was boxed in. So I couldn't go right and I couldn't go left and I was going 70 miles an hour and I couldn't stop. And you know what I did, Jenny? I don't know what I did. I drove right through it. And the last thing I remember is it was in my rear view mirror. I may be in the multiverse because I died. I may have been out of phase. It may have been out of phase. Your concrete wall may have been from another time. The truth is we don't know. But these experiences are very common. What I would say, and Dave and I talked about, and that is, Don't just pick yourself up and dust yourself off and go on like nothing happened. That's not scientific. Make a note of it. Keep a journal. Figure out how to recreate it. That's what I did with time in order to come up with these theories. All right. Let's get to another one here. And oh, where to go here? There it is. Nikki is asking, what is your opinion then of psychics and mediums who can see spirit? Please explain. Oh, I think that... They're just like aliens. They may, they may have a natural antenna, which they call it psychic, and they call it the ability to see spirits, and they can, they can tune into phase and out of phase better than we can, just like an alien could manipulate time. Some people have better antennas than others. That's for sure. Imagine your grandmother who knew that someone was going to call or parents who know that a child has died. They're tuned in in some way. I believe they're tuned in across space-time across space and time, and some may have more reliable antennas than others, and we call them psychics and channels and the ability, and people have these abilities, but truly it's rooted in science and it's rooted in, again, the two flutes. Hmm. NTR Blues is asking, Lisa, what do you think about the double slit experiment? Well, I mean, that's that's the basis for the quantum observation. And so if people don't know, it was a long time ago, 100 years ago, shooting a single photon out of a light source. So imagine you have a flashlight and you're shooting one photon out of it, right? And you shoot it onto something that will record its existence, a photoelectric plate. 
And when it was observed, it was a particle. And when it was not observed, it was a wave. That is the essence of consciousness causes collapse of the wave function, the basis of quantum mechanics. I think it's very real. I think that all of these quantum processes exist in our everyday world. We don't see them. We know they're there. We can model them mathematically and we can't control them or explain them yet, but we will. Do you believe then that each and every one of us is a multidimensional being? So that way there's versions of you, versions of me, versions of people listening on every timeline that we have going. So let's talk dimensions. And so one, you know, there are 11 dimensions exist and have been proven. Some think there are 26. Back to what dimensions are. Dimensions are simply the minimum number of things we need to measure something, right? And so, and time is a dimension. So imagine that we simply don't have the measurement to measure beyond our own physical existence. And we truly are multidimensional. And that multidimensional exists when we no longer have a physical body, and we're out of phase, right? We're somewhere else on a different timeline. And you and I today in these physical bodies can't measure it, but one day we will be able to. So yes, we would absolutely be multidimensional beings. Very cool. Very cool. So do you believe that we could technically, if we were to cross over into a different timeline, meet ourselves? Or do you think it would be like the back to the future effect where you shouldn't meet yourself on a different timeline? Well, those are two theories of time. And so one theory of time is that there's a multiple dimensions, but it always resolves into a single timeline. So imagine this. So in every moment, whatever a moment is, is birthed a new universe, but it resolves into a single timeline and we all go forward together. Somehow there's a resolution, the quantum ballet. There's another version where there's a multiverse a new universe emerges from every single moment and they're all in parallel and there's an infinite number of those. In the first one, it was back to the future. You can't kill your grandfather and still be here, right? In the second one, the multiverse, you can do anything you want because you'd simply go to a different universe and you could meet yourself. And the truth is we don't know, but they're both great to think about. It very much is. Very much is. I mean, would you want to meet your other self on a different timeline? I'm not sure. I'm more, first of all, I'm more of a block universe person. Carlo Orvelli, loop quantum gravity. Time exists in discrete now moments. And we perceive that it's, we're passing through time, but that's actually not what's happening. It's all happening at once. That's what I, I believe and my experience. And so a multiverse, I think that it's, uh, you know, it's an explanation and so I, to me, if I were, if I were able to meet myself, maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't, but I, I would more subscribe to the resolving to the single timeline. Think about it. It's a lot of work for the universe to have an unlimited number of timelines and universes. I think the universe is more efficient than that. I think it resolves. And so something happens and it resolves into a single timeline so that you couldn't go back and kill your own grandfather. But for lost time and for these death experiences we have, that may be loop quantum gravity, the block theory of time, where you're just kind of just stuck in a different block. You don't think anything bad could happen from that in meeting yourself? Well, clearly, of course, I'm a techie. I'm a Trekkie. And so there are versions, right? We've all seen Star Trek where they meet themselves and it's really not so good, right? So in a true multiverse explanation of the universe... Things go awry and wars are lost in one that we don't experience and really bad things happen. But we could imagine that there are a lot of things that are happening in this world that are really adverse. And there's a, quote, better world. So the truth is, I don't know. I don't really subscribe to the multiverse going on forever. It seems inefficient for the universe. Big J is asking, do time travelers from the future phase out and can't stay long? Well, of course, who, who knows, you know, so a time traveler versus at, let's say an alien who can manipulate time better than we can. I would imagine that an aliens who can travel great distances would have mastered time travel and they wouldn't have to phase out. And of course, time and matter are connected. So they could dematerialize. They could phase out and be out of phase it seems to me that if they're traveling that distance, they have a pretty good 
pretty good understanding of time and matter, and something like that really wouldn't affect them. They'd be able to stay if they wanted to. I think that they may not just choose to. Okay. Earlier we talked about immortals. Do you believe that there are immortals running or walking this planet right now that have been here for centuries? Or do you believe we're all immortal because the meat sack that we are in may disintegrate one day, but the soul and the consciousness continues on making each and every one of us immortal? I think that the latter, and that is, again, so in, uh, the, you have a fabulous computer in your head. It's neural chemical processes, right, consisting in the brain. Consciousness is much more than that. It's much more than the sum of its parts, right? It's way beyond that. Conservation of energy, the first law of thermodynamics. Energy is only changed. It's never lost. So consciousness never leaves. And so when the body dies, which clearly entropy exists, and that is things grow, age, and, de and decay, right? As we see with entropy, things grow from a state of order to disorder. Bodies do that. But consciousness doesn't. That's just changed into a different energy. That would be my belief. Where do you believe consciousness goes? Well, I think in the, exist in the, in the story of my mother, I don't think it went too far, Right. And so in a lot of other stories of out-of-body experiences, again, stu studying with Bill Buhlman at the Monroe Institute, who's a, a famous and really well-known teacher of out-of-body, he would say that you're in your room and head for the door. When, you're out, when you have an out-of-body experience, you're right in the room and you can see the room. You could even see your body. So that means you don't go very far I and mean, you could just be here. That's an amazing thought and really wonderful, I think. So what is your opinion then on reincarnation? That's interesting. And so the Tucker book, as people know, right? So the extraordinary stories of children, of past lives of children. And so uh, talk about this phenomenon where children are having memories they couldn't possibly have of famous people and non-famous people. And so I think if there's an explanation for that, and I go into this in this book, it's quantum entanglement right? It's the separation of two particles in space and time over a long distance, right? That can instantly communicate. And one was in the past and one is in the present. And those two particles are exhibiting the same condition, the same uh, characteristics spin in quantum mechanics, but it may be different for a, a child who is reincarnated. And the consciousness is related to quantum entanglement. All right, let's get to another question from Nikki. What are your thoughts on ETs growing a human clone, putting that clone in stasis, then when needed, the ETs pull a human's consciousness out and inserts it into the cloned human for whatever purpose? Well, I don't, I don't uh, tend to go toward the malevolent in anything. And so that sounds pretty malevolent. And so I would believe that um, if we were visited by consciousnesses and, and beings and civilizations, which are so far more advanced than we are, then they really wouldn't have the need to fool around with human beings like that. They would have much better things to do. They may want to learn from us, but I don't believe that there's a malevolent intent. So I, I wouldn't, couldn't really see that happening. Okay. What about, have you ever heard about this where some people believe that during a near-death experience, that they had a walker come in and take over, like there was a soul change or a consciousness change, and they are actually a different person inside the same body? I have heard that, and in fact, a friend of mine had that experience. And to this day, he's a different person. So, well, so think of the, the physical body, your corporeal sac, your, you know, the molecules and biology that makes up our bodies. We're sort of holding a consciousness. And even the, the brain is simply biology. It's an organ. And consciousness is different from that. Is it possible that another consciousness could be there? I suppose it's possible for sure. I don't ascribe malevolence to it, I have to say. I would ascribe more of a past life thing, right? The Tucker book about the past lives of the extraordinary past lives of children, where that might happen. Uh, and I think it's very possible. I always wondered how that happened 
or if it was even possible. Because if someone gets into an accident or has a near-death experience like you have, and I've never had it, so please correct me if I'm wrong, I see it as the trauma from that accident or whatever happened that caused that near-death experience literally changes a person. Changes a person. And it changes the way they think. It changes the way they live life. It changes, you know, everything about them where maybe they didn't smell the roses before where now they're taking the time to do so. Do you really believe that maybe it's just the result of a new consciousness of understanding life or that a walk-in actually happened? Well, I don't know about a walk-in, but back to the Monroe Institute, they've studied this quite extensively. And that is the physical and psychological and intelligence related to near-death and out-of-body experiences. And what you will find if you go on their website, well-studied, thousands and thousands of subjects, intelligence increases, fear decreases, quality of life improves. It is a highly recommended experience for people because you live differently. And you know, Dave, I don't think those things come just because we decide to smell the roses. It's hard to explain an increase in intelligence because you decide to smell the roses. Something else is happening in the brain. But that doesn't mean that somebody has had a walk-in come in and a change of souls. Yeah, I don't know about that. Again, I do know someone who believes that happened for them, and he does seem like a totally different person. I haven't experienced it, and I haven't thought much about that. Would was that would that be something you want to think about? It seems kind of malevolent, unless it's a good idea. Again, I don't tend to go that way, and in fact, that's even a, that is another uh, symptom, if you will, a, a, you know, an after effect of out of body and near death experiences, where you tend to not ascribe things to fearful sources. You have a no no scarce resources. Very little malevolence, nothing to be afraid of view of the world. All right, let's go to Tony here. If ET have the ability to just appear at will, why do you think they need a craft that people see? Well, I, if they're, if they have an ability to appear at will, if they can manipulate time, right, then they could appear on earth, but it may be limited for them. Plus, you know, a craft may be something that's convenient for them. Maybe we're creating the crafts in our minds. Maybe the crafts are the ETs. Clearly, people have seen things. And now, of course, the government is being more forthright about all of the different reports from the Air Force and from the different military agencies about what has been seen over time. I don't know the answer to that. Maybe it's convenient to have a craft. Maybe in order to travel through the wormholes, they actually need that. And the ability to just appear somewhere like you're transporting in Star Trek is beyond even their ability. All right. Flippity is asking, is the heavy electricity feeling during a supernatural event caused by quantum draw of electrons? Boy, I have wondered that. And so you do, uh, sometimes you feel like you're sinking into something, you're going into the quantum field, and sometimes you feel like you're being uplifted. That is mysterious. It's a very unique physical sensation. It could be either, though. You could be uplifted or a sinking feeling. There's certainly something going on at the quantum level. And as we said about before, as we talked about before, we know these quantum processes exist. We know they're in our everyday life. We can't see them. We can't control them. But I think we're going to have greater understanding of them, and hopefully very soon. So the answer is, I don't know, but I think that might be the case. All right. We got about just over a minute left with you tonight, Lisa. And I want to say a big thank you for coming on Spaced Out Radio. You are amazing. Amazing. It has been a blast. I know I didn't do you any justice. The audience did. I did not. Uh, I'll be (laughs) self-deprecating there. But could you do me a favor and tell everybody where they can find your website and your book? Sure. And so my uh, my website, which is the same as the book site, is lisabroderick.com and all and also allthetimebook.com. And so if you go there, you can find out more about me and more about the book and more about other things we're doing. We are having a contest. I'll announce a contest. And that is the best time shifting stories, because as on this program and I'm on media a little bit, both on national radio and television, I'm going to begin to share these stories with others. 
So if you go on the website and submit your story in the contest, we're going to pick, I think, three stories a month for the next couple of months. We'll share them on national television and national radio. And we'd love to do that. Much appreciate you coming on, Lisa Broderick. A great time here uh, learning from you. My brain is killing me. And I promise I won't stress about time anymore. How about that? (laughs) You are cured, Dave. You're cured. I am cured. all the time in the world. Thank you. Actually, that does mean a lot. It really does. Lisa Broderick, everybody. All the time. Book.com. Coming up next, the fedora wearing John Hudson will be by with the unbiased UFO report. We got Shirky Poo's news. The thought of the day, the jam packed final half hour of Space Down Radio. Right around the clock here. Great job, Lisa. <laughs> Dave, it was a blast. Thanks I'm, so much. Yes, I, I'm sure you're going to be uh, be like uh, to your uh, to your uh, publicist after this. What the hell did you put me on? What did you what? put me on? And also the live bookstore thing where I was coaching people for two and a half hours as well. It's yeah. been a day. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. Going to be honest. I can hear your publicist getting ready for a cringe right now. Really spaced out radio. <laughs> Some Canadian guy who doesn't oh, even know what the hell we're talking no. about. This was a it blast. A total blast. You. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for entertaining our audience tonight. Absolutely. Anytime, Dave. Love to come back. Much love. Take care. Have a great evening, you too. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. I would absolutely love for Lynn Wallington to interview her. I don't think I did her justice. I really do not, and I apologize. Hi, John. What's up, buddy? I feel like I just got my ass kicked. Uh, no, actually, Dave, I know it. I actually, I, I think you did quite well. I, I think you did quite well. And, um, you know, the, the truth of the matter is, is that most of the quote unquote layman's that try to get into the kind of topics that she does have not actually done the kind of research that she's done. I was quite impressed with the breadth of her knowledge and even the depth she'd gone into certain topics. And, and she was, she was well-read. She understood a lot of, I mean, the, the fact that she was pulling in Bowman from the Monroe Institute and pulling in Carlo Rovelli. I mean, she was pulling in some very, you know, normally completely unrelated topics and, and, you know, she, she, she was, she was good. And uh, so I, I, I thought you did it really well, but I have to be honest with you. I was biting at the bit. I was dying. I was just like, I want to be there. I want to ask her this. I want to ask her that. I want to ask her. I was like, I was going nuts. <laughs> I'll be right back, dude. I got to just uh, take a quick bathroom break. Yeah, no worries, man. Oh, man. So how y'all doing? Everyone doing well? Yeah, no, she was, she was cool. She was, I mean, I, I got to say, you know, just me perfect, you know, me, me personally, I, I don't agree with everything she she said. I mean, I don't um, I think some of her, um, you know, I disagree with some of her conclusions, but um, she did. She's done a fabulous amount of research and she's very she has a very clear thinking procedure. And so it's it's totally I mean, it's as likely that she's right as it is that I am. Right. I mean, there's no there's there's no reason to believe that, you know, um, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, it's it's um but even even with the stuff I disagree with, I like the, the conclusions she came to. Yeah, I know. I'm going to bring that up today. I I'm very sad about my my lack of my Mojave trip. Um, I, I got to be really honest with everyone. Uh, e- even if I'd won, I I I, I just I don't think I would have gone. Um, uh, maybe I would have, but um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I would I would uh, yeah, I don't know. I uh. Uh, we'd have, we have to see. We'd have to see. Um, but there's a lot more coming to that story. So hold on to your seats. Uh, and that's not, I don't mean tonight. I mean, the next couple of days, there's going to be some stuff coming. So, How are you doing, John? Um, doing, doing okay. Doing pretty good. So I want to I wanna, I wanna, uh, uh, offer you an analogy uh, that might help you with, with some of the concepts that you guys were talking about, right? After the so show. You th- Okay. All right. You got it. It was going to be like, you know, 30 seconds, but okay. But, but, uh, but you got it. My brain is fried over her. And I mean that in a good way. 
Yeah, no, it was a great conversation. It was very interesting. It was very, very interesting. The book I said at the start of the show, um, uh, you mean Carlo Rovelli? I that might have been what you're talking about. Car Carlo Rovelli is a is a physicist, and um, um, he he's written a couple of books. The one for everyone to start with is there is one called like the S Seven Lessons in Physics. I think it is. You can get it in audiobook, and it's the only one that he actually narrates himself. So you get it in his native Eng uh, Italian accent, and uh, and it's fun. It's a fun fun book it's a sh it's basically a short version of one of his bigger books um and it's oh it's so much fun so i don't know if you're talking about carlo rovelli but i, I think you might have been all right <laughs> give me two seconds here big thank you to todd lynn r and r dirt road thomas simon for the super chats really do appreciate that uh no i have not seen dolan and Dodie talk mibs yet steven and YJ, I swear to God, man, I did not see a single one of your questions on my chat room. I really did not. I know you're not going to believe me again, but I swear to God, I didn't see one. Here we go. Rounding third, we're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. Want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading Shirky Poo's Newswire, and what's the other one? Oh, yeah, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We bring in the fedora-wearing John Hudson. Here comes the UFO report. Yeah, it's that time once again where the fedora-wearing John Hudson comes on in to Space Down Radio, breaks down the latest and greatest in the UFO news that is going on around the world. And John, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone, for sticking around. It's nice to see everybody. All right. Let's get right to it. Video from 1995 from the Air Force that military.com brought out i saw this earlier today man and i was like really are we getting another well, to me, video i know i know so so first there's so many there's so many interesting aspects to the story right so so first off like dave said this this is basically it was a it was, it was that there was an old show called hard copy and basically hard copy did an did an episode in 1995 about a uh, air force video of a bloody ufo i mean that's what it looks like right and it's actually, it's not a bad video. And, uh, and what's so amazing about this story is one, this happened in 1995 and most everyone I talked to had no idea. I had no memory of it whatsoever. had no idea what it was. And the, so the, one, so that's weird Two, military.com. I mean, not, not that it's not like the military.com website is run by the DOD or anything. Right. Like, I mean, don't put that much, you know, like, prestige on it but still it's a it's a somewhat con somewhat conservative periodical and uh, and they pull this out of the woodworks right and but to me the real story beyond this and i encourage you guys to go watch the video because it's kind of cool is it it just it once again supports my my current frustrating hypothesis which is that it's not about events it's not about some big event happening that makes everyone aware we've had a ton of events that should have made everyone aware and they didn't work <laughs> 
And there's there's a ton of them. If you go back in UFO history, there's a ton of these things. And this is just another perfect example. Like I watched the video. To me, this this was as impressive of a video as as like the Tic Tac. You know, I mean, and like no one like no one cared. It blows my mind. I just I don't get it. I, I mean, you agree, Dave. It was an interesting video, right? I thought it was. And you know what? I swear I saw this video on hard copy in 1995. Okay, well, good. I really I'm, I'm, swear I did. did. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're the first. <laughs> well, I'm old. I'm old. You know? It's what happens. You're the f- you yeah, know? it's just like, but anyway, it's go, go check it out. I'll, I'll put it in my notes. Go check it out. It's a cool video. And there's not like there's anything to follow up on it. It's just, to me, it's just like military.com did it and it's hard copy and it was in 1995. Like, where did this come from? So it was it just kind of blew my mind. Yeah, it, it, it kind of blew my mind too. Why is this video coming back to fruition now? I have no clue. I have absolutely no clue whatsoever. The, the only thing I can guess is that like the, the writers over at military.com were just like, you know, pouring through Google and just, well, probably not Google for this, maybe DuckDuckGo, but they were pouring through search engines and found it. That's the only thing I can think of because it, it doesn't relate to anything. It was just, it was just this random story. And, but like why that wasn't on CNN when it came out, I have no idea. Like it was on hard copy and then no one followed up on it. Right. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It really is unbelievable. All right. Let's move on to Anjali here because yeah, the, the, oh, so sad. The retreat to go find aliens in the Mojave Desert that we all knew wasn't going to happen is now officially, unofficially, not happening. Well, um, uh, you know, I, I have, I have her, I have her quote here. She said, um, "With great respect, um, the expedition to the mountain is postponed." Uh, Wayne uh, has now said that no one may enter his property, including myself. Uh, my intentions are to press forward. I will gather the team and they will be briefed and together we will determine a plan of action. Uh, I need backup. Uh, and um, so uh, essentially she, she is still trying to give people hope that it's going to happen. Um, I, and, and I will say this, I, I actually do believe that she wants to do this. I don't know why, because I don't think it's going to end well. But I do, I do believe she wants to do this for some reason. Um, however, from what I'm hearing, Wayne, the gentleman's name, um, uh, Wayne has actually talked to some people. And Wayne is evidently going to be interviewed, uh, I believe, in the beginning of December. And um, I'm still getting details on this. And um, my understanding is that Wayne isn't as doesn't feel the same way that Angeli does and wishes to speak his mind. And, um, I don't think expand on that. What do you mean by that? Well, from what I, from what I've heard and I haven't talked to him, he has no idea who she is. There's no tunnel. He never dug a hole and there's no portal. And he's rather irritated that people have been calling him. Yeah. It's weird. (laughs) It's super weird. (laughs) Especially because if you listen to her original story, it was Wayne that she met in the coffee shop that overheard her conversation, that struck up a conversation with her and took her back to his property. It, Wayne was the whole instigator of this whole thing. So now that there's, there's this great Wayne's World meme that's blown up all over Twitter, you know, and, it's, and, <laughs> it's Wayne's World. <laughs> and she's she's telling stories that one of the reasons why he shut it down is allegedly this Wayne gentleman has cancer. Well, I had heard that when she first told her story in the very beginning, she alluded to that. She alluded that he had been fighting cancer at some point in the past. I didn't know that he was I didn't know that he was still fighting it. I didn't know what stage it was in or anything like that. But she had alluded to before that Wayne was ill. Um, And um, and but, you know, the funny thing is a couple people on Twitter have taken the opposite stance and they're like, Wayne, Wayne's trying to stop this closure. Somebody, somebody I you're trying that. to place Wayne as, as the as the evil villain in this scenario. And even Angeli was coming up to Wayne's defense, going, "No, no, 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 Wayne's a nice guy." <laughs> how, how does he not know who Angeli is? 
Who's telling the Well, he knows here? now. I'll tell you that. Well, I realize <laughs> that he knows now, but are you buying his story that he's never seen her before in his life? Because, look, I mean, it's the same thing. Like, if, if somebody puts you in an uncomfortable predicament, you're going to try and, and hit that deny button very well. It's easy. Look, it's easy with everything Anjali has said to blame her, okay, or to him throw... Hmm throw her under the bus, say, I don't know who this lady is. Right? Yep. Oh, no. Oh, absolutely. No, no, no. I mean, it, it's, that's the problem. There's so many possibilities, right? It's possible that he really doesn't know anything. It's possible that, that most of what we heard happened as it said, but when realistically there was only a small tunnel, and when each of them got to the end of it, they just went into a trance and thought they went somewhere and didn't actually go somewhere. It's, po- I mean, there's so many possible, there's so many possible explanations to what happened. Well, and, you know, and it's very possible that, that Wayne, when he introduced her to this and all this was thinking that, you know, this is not going to end up on, you know, CNN. And, you know, I'm just sharing this with a, with a fellow experiencer sort of a thing. And now that he's seen all the press that she's generated and the, and the things she did on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, he's like, Ah, I'm out of here. And maybe he is just denying it all. I, I agree with you. I think it's possible. Hold on one second, because Matthew Quiet Riot in our chat room says he talked, to, talked Wayne to Wayne three weeks ago, said Wayne Nicely was done. not emu- amused. <laughs> all right. And then he said Wayne said he would do an interview. Okay. who Who's he but doing? My... I, I believe it is um I believe it is um Steve uh, uh Cambian? Cham- Chamberlain Cambian Cambian I believe it is I believe it's Cambian I believe he's the one who got the interview I I, I believe it's the first week of December um okay. and, uh, and and I will say that the Angeli went the other day went on a show with with him and uh Jeremy alien scientist and like three other or two other people that are all pretty anti her hypothesis and she actually went on and debated it with them it was only like a 14 minute show i haven't watched it yet but i got to say i i give her props for for you know for for trying well let's see what else matthew has to say says wayne said he didn't know anjali and wayne was super nice no, Wayne is an honestly nice dude. She knew Good. he had cancer. He didn't call it off because of it. Uh, Matthew said, I told folks three weeks ago this was going to happen. And then she had to make a move, according to Matthew. Uh, he doesn't know anything. He said, who? Can you say her name again? He was so <laughs> confused. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. man, this is this at is some great, level this, this is, is great beautiful. stuff. I mean <clears throat> this is the this is the woo battery that just keeps on wooing. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it's astounding. It really is. It's astounding. Right? It, it is it is astounding. It is astounding. Yeah. Unbelievable. I don't know. We'll find out more you know, same bat time, same bat channel. So uh, all right. Finally, explain to us who John Ramirez is. Okay. Now now we have some real stuff, okay? So I'll try to I'll try to, you know, get more serious here. So, um John Ramirez is um is a is a really lovely individual. Um I um, you know, just for full disclosure, I'm in a uh well, you know, one of the 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 small, you know, side chat things that I'm on on a Discord is a small group, you know, very small group and he's one of them. And so I've been talking to him for a couple months and he's a, he's a really good guy. And uh, he basically retired from the CIA in 2009. He was a GS-15, which is essentially the highest rank you can achieve as a civilian without going into an executive role. So he is, believe I believe, the same rank that, that Elizondo was at. Um, at one point, he and Elizondo did work in the same building, um, but they never actually saw each other. So they, at that point, they didn't know each other existed. And uh, And basically... What uh, what John has decided to do is John decided to create a presentation. It's um, I believe if I remember correctly, it's seventy four slides. There's be a link to it in the, in the in the notes. And this presentation is astounding. This presentation is absolutely astounding. And the reason why it's astounding is the very end of it is just fun. It's like his crazy hypotheses about what might be this and what might be that, and that's entertaining. But the bulk of it is 
teaching all of us how the government actually works, who actually controls what data, and where we all should actually be filing our, our FIOAs to. That's really what it is. It's a lesson about how to file better FOIAs, right? That's really what the presentation is. However, in the presentation, several other things were said that I wanted to call it light to. So one of them is a gift to you, Dave. And, uh, and that is that um, uh, he was asked, you know, um, uh, you know, about, you know, why he, he thought, in his opinion, that Lou Elizondo had not used the word hybrids or talked about hybrids. And, and, you know, did he think that this was a word that, you know, Lou wasn't supposed to use for some reason? And, uh, and, and John Marius gave an interesting response. He, he basically kind of, you know, was kind of like, you know, kind of, to me, kind of gave like a well, of course, kind of response. And, but basically said, um, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here. Um, uh, and, and I want to know, I, I have a message in to John, you know, to get to make it clarity about this to make sure that I'm understanding right. He wasn't able to get back to me before the show. But going on what he said in the in interview, in interview, what he said was, it's not time yet. It's not, it's, that hasn't happened yet in the schedule. The other things happen, ha other things have, have to happen first. Is essentially what he said. Like what? Uh, he didn't say, he didn't say that, but basically what he just, what he just, what he, what he was implying was that there was a, dun, da, 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 a narrative, right? I mean, that's Go really figure. what it was implying was, was that there, you know, there's a schedule. And that, you know, and that certain things have to happen before other things happen and that there's a, there's an order of operations and that using the word hybrid in public is something that's not supposed to happen till later. And that was like, huh, like that, that surprised me. I, that caught me off guard, I must admit. Um, and so that was fun. And um, and then uh, the other thing. So there, uh, basically, there's a lot of great things in this presentation. I recommend everyone look at it. But what I pulled out of it mainly was a gift for Dave and a gift for me. Uh, so the gift for me part is is that uh, the other day when I was telling all you guys about um, the relationship between a swap, uh, a swap, <laughs> awesome. ASAP, and and a tip, uh, and I was talking about the 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 ridiculous kind of uh, infighting that's been going on about the funding and how a tip didn't need funding because they didn't have to build any buildings, they didn't have to you know hire anyone, they didn't have to buy any stuff. It was just opex opex basically, which means everyone's already got a salary. They're all paid and so they didn't need to have extra funding well essentially in this you know in the presentation john ramirez said almost exactly what i said i mean he even said if you don't have to build any buildings he actually used that same phrase i was blown away um and and so basically we have a a gs15 former cia confirming exactly what i told you all and so that was my gift and so but i highly recommend you guys check it out it's one hell of a presentation and i'll provide a link to it in the notes all right and that'll be on from john's twitter account to our twitter account at spaced out radio he always tags us in it john another great episode of the unbiased ufo report we'll talk thank to you, you in sir. a few minutes in the after hours and thank you so much for your great work buddy let's get to the news thank you Let's get right to Shirky Poo's news. A family who thought their grandfather's body was going to be donated to science after he died learned that he ended up as a sideshow for an oddities event dissected in front of a paying public audience in the middle of a hotel event room across the country. The body of David Saunders, a 97-year-old World War II veteran, ended up in the ballroom of a Portland, Oregon Marriott Hotel where people paid up to $500 for tickets to see a live autopsy in person. The family discovered what happened to their grandfather's body only after an undercover journalist with Seattle news outlet King 5 attended the October event and spotted the man's name on a tag hanging from his body. The autopsy, performed by a retired college anatomy professor, included several hours of dissection section, slicing into the chest cavity, and removing organs and the brain. 
Mike Clark, a funeral director in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, handled Saunders' body after his death. Clark said that he passed the body to a private company called MedEd Labs, which claimed to solicit corpses for medical research purposes. That company then sold the body to Jeremy Siliberto, the founder of DeathScience.org, who partnered with the Oddities and Curiosities Expo to hold the cadaver autopsy event. Siliberto said he bought the bodies for this event for more than ten grand. The Oddities and Curiosities Expo is a traveling event that hosts vendors and offers classes like taxidermy for jackalopes and two-headed ducklings. We truly have something weird for everyone at our show, the Expo's website says. All items you see are on our shows are legal to own and sustainably source. Siliberto advised that these events on his TikTok account... This is weird, man. I'm continuing with this story. People involved claim that they were duped by the next person in the line of custody to take possession of Saunders' body. Clark said that he was under the impression that MedEd Labs would use the corpse for medical research. Apparently, that's not happening, as Dead Grandpa is now a circus clown. All right, moving on. The bloom of a giant and stinky Sumatran flower, nicknamed the Corpse Flower... Well, it's because it smells like a dead body is drawing huge crowds in California's Southern Botanical Garden. The bloom, it began Sunday afternoon at the San Diego Botanic Gardens in Encinitas. Yep, but by the morning time, timed entry tickets had sold out and more than 5,000 people were expected to have visited the garden by today. The bloom of the corpse plant lasts just 48 hours. During its peak, the flower emits a putrid odor of rotting flesh to attract carrion beetles and flesh flies to help its pollination process. Isn't that pleasant? Thought of the Dave, about to happen right now. Let's get to it. What does time mean to you? Science Bob, the sequence of events that leads to increased thermodynamic entropy. Chris, I'm not sure. Ask them, maybe. Like his dogs, they'll know. They seem to have plenty of it. Magnus, nothing. Dave, money. David, time is like a rubber band. Time is at our command. Jaretta, past, present, and future. Joshua, time to me is a construct created in order to experience our version of reality the way it was intended. Kenneth, timing is everything. Joe, time is nature's way of keeping everything from happening at once. Krista, I have access to a lot more of it when I'm not stuck in my head trying to control my life into existence. Sparkles, time is interesting. I have noticed for years that there seems to be slow time days and fast time days. Mike, long story, for time is a perception of our own humans and our own senses. Interesting. All right, Lori, time is where we place our conscious awareness. Danny, time is an abstract concept. Evan has the final word. Ask me later. Thank you for everybody participating in the Thought of the Dave. We really do appreciate it. Thank you to Shirky Poo for the news. John Hudson for the UFO report. And author Lisa Broderick talking about time. It was interesting, wasn't it? We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone. Chatting away on YouTube, Twitch, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Space Down Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we're watching. We own the night, Mr. Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home.
Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them too. Good night.